Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third day of the Maxine 10 Years Later Conference. Welcome to the third day of the Maxine 10 Years Later Conference. I'm Steve May, Department Head and Professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Drexel University, and I will be your moderator uh, for today. So a few logistics first. Uh, all participants are in listen-only mode. So if you have trouble connecting to your computer's audio, please call in using the phone number listed on this slide or in your meeting invite. Uh, we would like our session to be interactive. So we, we really encourage you to submit your questions uh, to the organizers and presenters through the chat box on the webinar screen. A recording and slide deck uh, will be available on the Maxine Conference website uh, following the conference. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to introduce our first speaker today. Our plenary speaker is Michael Nagib, Assistant Professor in the Department of Physics and Engineering Physics at Tulane University. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Nagib. Hello, everyone. So um, I hope you see my screen clear. Um, so it is really my pleasure and my honor to be here today uh, virtually. Unfortunately, I was hoping to go visit Drexel, but um, it's, it's great to have this event going. Um, it, is, it is, as I said, my honor to present in this event. It's after 10 years of Maxine discovery. Uh, so I'm Mike Nagib and uh, Ken and Ruth Arnold, Eric Carey Professor in Science and Engineering and Assistant Professor at Department of Physics and Engineering Physics at Tulane. Um, my title of the talk is Role of Intercalation in Maxine's Processing and Performance. Uh, but I thought that before I start talking about intercalation in Maxine's right away, I would, since I'm the first speaker today, I'm not sure if people were attending um, yesterday and the day before or not. So I would start with a very brief introduction about max phase as the material from which we make maxines. Uh, so max phase ternary transition metal carbides or nitrides and um, M it stands for early transition metals, any of those yellow highlighted in this periodic table. A is any of those red highlighted, mostly, used to be mostly groups 13 and 14, but now it's growing. Uh, X is either carbon nitrogen. So, they have a structure of MN, a uh, structure of a hexagonal layered structure, and the actual composition is MN plus one AXN. So if N equal one, you have a one slab of transition metal carbide, like what you see here um, at the bottom uh, right picture. Uh, let's see if I can have the, just a second, the laser pointer. Okay, never mind. So um, we have single block transition metal carbide, and those single blocks are interleaved with a metal layer. If n equal two, we have double blocks. If n equal three, triple blocks. And very recently, um, Yuri's group from Drexel, they now have uh, n equal four and even higher. So the number of, of max phases are large, and they are continuously growing. Uh, we are talking about more than 155 max phases. So far, and they are also solid solution. At uh, M site, you can have different transition metals, and also at the X site, you can have carbon and nitrogen in solid solution. So we're talking about a huge family of materials. How do we make them? Usually, simple powder metallurgy, mixing powders together, and then heating under inert atmosphere, and then crushing, sieving, and then you get powders. Or also, you can have do it with molten salt, and instead of uh, starting with elemental powders, you can have start with um, compounds that can make a molten salt and you heat it and then you get your material. Also, you can do a bit axial um, thin film growth for this material, magnetron sputtering, for example, you can make thin films of max phase. Okay, so I thought that since this is the 10th year of Maxine's, I would it might make sense to talk to give a little bit of a brief of how we really made Maxine first. So um, you can read about that in the preface of the book edited by Babaka Nasuri and Yuri Dogotsi and published recently. Uh, and we had uh, Michelle, Yuri, and I wrote this preface about the beginning of Maxine, the story of the discovery as told by inventors. It's an interesting story. I'll try to briefly 
tells a story for uh, the audience. I think it might it might be inspiring for uh, graduate students. Uh, so I think it's worth doing. So how it all starts, this is a, a picture from my graduation at Drexel in 2014. Actually, this was the end of my trip at Drexel or my journey at Drexel. Uh, it started in 2010. And this picture you see here, Yuri at the left and Michelle's right and I'm in the middle here. Um, it has been a wonderful experience at, at Drexel for me. But as Albert Einstein uh, says, if we knew what it is, uh, if it was uh, we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? Um, would I say I was um, hired to make 2D materials of transition metal carbide? Absolutely not. Um, this was not the plan. It, it, is, it just happened with the, with the while the research was progressing. Um, so the, pl the plan was max or, or the idea of my work was, okay, we have these max phases that they have the A layer, aluminum, silicon, tin, and those A layers are known to be good uh, electrochemical active for lithium. And the max phase are electrically conductive and they are mechanically robust. So they have everything to suggest them to be good electrodes for lithium ion battery. And actually, Yuri and Michelle wrote a proposal to DOE proposing this idea of using max phase as electrodes for lithium ion batteries. And at, at that time, I was a brand new graduate student, and I was, this was one of my side projects is to collect some preliminary results. And eventually, I, I tried a lot and many, many times to use the max phase as electrodes for lithium ion battery, but I failed. And the, any measured capacity at that time was mostly due to metal or intermetallic impurities. So this was a big disappointing. Uh, but anyway, by the time um, we got this uh, realization that what we were measuring and what we were excited about was mostly impurities at that time, we got the fund of about $1 million from DOE. So this, okay, there, there should be a way that we can still make use of this conductive material for battery. So we had two hypotheses at that time. Uh, first, that max phase particles are very large. They are ceramics that 20, 30, 40, 50 microns. And this can be a problem. And this is known to be a problem for silicon, for example. The other hypothesis that is a gallery in between the max phases layers are packed with the A layers and they cannot accommodate any lithium. So these were two hypotheses of why they didn't work. So we wanted to address these and then try to make, to make it work. So first, let's try to reduce the particle size and remove some of the A layer out. And tried milling max phase powders down to one micron. It didn't really work much. We didn't get any enhancement in the capacity. And when we tried to remove some of the A layer out, we tried in the beginning high temperature treatment like this one, for example, soaking max phase like titanium aluminum carbide and lithium fluoride molten salt at 900 C, it, yeah, it did result in removing the aluminum layer out of the structure completely. But due to the high temperature, what happened is the uh, twinning uh, of the titanium carbide blocks, and then we formed a rock salt structure of titanium carbide, cubic titanium carbide. So not, not electrochemically active at that time, and it was not that interesting for the application we were trying to do. So then I said, okay, why we don't use HF? Um, yeah, it is a nasty acid, and, but it, it has some interesting capabilities. For example, we know that the green boundaries of the max phases, they, are, they all usually have a very thin intermetallic layer. So if we can use the hydrochloric acid to remove the intermetallic green boundary, then we can hopefully reduce the particle size of the max phase significantly to granular, um, hopefully small grain size, which was one of the goals to get to great small grain size. Also, HF is known is actually one of very few that can dissolve metal oxide. Titanium oxide is very hard to break through it uh, because it's very corrosive, corrosion resistant, it's very chemical inert. So HF is one of very few that can penetrate and can dissolve these oxides. And max phases are known to be good oxidation resistance material because they form a protective layer of titanium oxide, for example, or transition metal oxide or aluminum oxide on the surface that protects it from further oxidation. So if we can penetrate through this oxide, we then can get to the A layer and we can remove the A layer very easily at lower temperature without destroying the structure. And it, this what happened is we got our first Maxine. Um, so actually our first report of Maxine was in 2011 as an experiment was done in August 2010. So it's exactly 10 years ago. 
So we removed aluminum. We reported on removing aluminum from titanium three, aluminum carbon two. But actually the first experiment was um, titanium two, aluminum carbon. And here's what we got. This is the first XRD from Maxine ever. So we start with titanium two, aluminum carbon powder commercially from Cantal at that time, Swedish company. And after etching, we don't see much uh, of the titanium two, aluminum carbon uh, max phase peaks. The main peak at 40 degrees disappear. And if you press the powder, we get this very nice um, X-ray on, on the top here. Um, we have broad peaks downshifted significantly from the 002 peaks that was initially at 12. So the idea was this, is, this peak is highly shifted from where the titanium two aluminum carbon peak was. And at that time, and, and we also only got 10% after etching. So we start with one gram and we end up with just 0.1 gram. So what eventually the idea was, okay, we have um, these titanium two aluminum carbon and the main peak of the 002, you see that around 12 degrees. So it has some small impurity of titanium three aluminum carbon two. You see the peak just below 10 degrees in the orange X-ray diffraction. This is the 002 of titanium three aluminum carbon two. It's about 10% of the titanium two aluminum carbon. So what happens is the titanium two aluminum carbon got completely dissolved and only the titanium three aluminum carbon two that was impurity in that sample got etched and we, may, we got the titanium, the first ever titanium three C2. So this is just, um, it, it, and then we got the yield of 100%. When you put titanium three aluminum carbon two in HF, you almost get no weight loss because the aluminum is replaced by OH and F. So here's uh, going from Max to Maxine. In HF, we remove the A-layer out of the structure. You go from this bulky-like ceramic to this open morphology. And this looks very similar to exfoliated graphite. The picture you see on the top right side here. And if you do sonication, you can separate some of the layers from each other. And you see from the inset here, the select A electron diffraction that's showing that hexagonal structure is still there. So we didn't convert from 3D crystalline to 2D amorphous, we still have 2D crystallinity in the material. So, and the uh, XPS confirms that we don't have any more aluminum and what we have is surf mixed surface termination of o, OH and F. And you'll find that I'll be using TX or TZ after that to describe these uh, surface terminations. So if you see them, these are not new elements, it's just a uh, abbreviation for surf mixed surface termination. So then shortly after we found that, okay, if it's, we picked different subfamilies of the max phase and we found that yes, we can actually etch the n equal one, the n equal two, the n equal three. Uh, there was no n equal four at that time. Uh, so n equal three, for example, like tantalum four C three, n equal one, like titanium two C. And we managed to get them eventually by controlling the etching conditions uh, until we managed to get to those different uh, subgroups. And we proved at that time that this is actually a big family of material. Nowadays, there are more than 30 different machines successfully synthesized, and, and this is thanks to groups from all over the world. Um, okay, and not only max phases can be etched, other um, layered carbides can too. Okay, now enough about the background about max phases and about the discovery of the maxines. Uh, let's dig deeper and have a closer look at the structure and the interlayer bonding between these 2D sheets. So, uh, right after my graduation from Drexel, I went to Oak Ridge National Lab as a Wigner Fellow um, to, uh, to study Maxine and to study energy storage in general uh, there. So we, the Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, they have the Spallation Neutron Source, which is a great facility uh, to study um, materia materials using neutron. So um, as you see here, the beauty of neutron compared to X-ray uh, you see the red dot here for X-ray. This is a cross-section of hydrogen atom compared to the big blue circle here or sphere here for titanium. Uh, while for neutrons, the cross-section of hydrogen is much bigger uh, than that for an X-ray. So we can use neutron to look closely at the hydrogen, which is very important in case of vaccines because we have hydrogen on the surface that can determine the property and the behavior of this material. So here we picked three different materials and this worked was done in collaboration with Shu Wan Wang and uh, Kate Page from um, uh, SNS at that time at Oak Ridge National Lab. So um, we picked three different maxines. Um, all of them are titanium 3C2. So just the differences are they synthesized slightly different. One of them are using HF 
black one here, HF 48%, the red one, and the blue one is HF 48%, then treated with ammonium hydroxide. I'll just talk about the first two ones, that HF 10% and HF 48%. And what we found was actually interesting that, first of all, the amount of hydroxyl we have is different. So the HF 10% has more hydroxyl than the HF 48%. Second, when we do the, when, when Schwann did the fitting, actually, she did the fitting, I didn't do it myself, um, we, she found that we have, that the HF 10% has perfect AB, AB stacking with one third, two thirds Z, while HF 48% has more random stacking. And also the HF 10%, um, both samples have mixture of hydrogen and van der Waal, but when you look at the hydrogen of the HF 10 here uh, in the black plot, uh, compared to the hydrogen and the 48%, which is the orange plot here. Uh, the, the shorter the hydrogen bond is a stronger hydrogen bond. You see that the HF10 has much stronger hydrogen bonds compared to the HF48%. And actually we find that they have different properties. And when, you, when it comes to uh, trying to separate the layers from each other, for example, the HF10% is harder to separate because it has more stronger hydrogen bonding. So, now we have this kind of mixture of hydrogen van der Waal bonding that in principle, you can interpolate different uh, molecules, different cations between the layers. And this was actually done early on, uh, right after the discovery that we found, yes, we can intercalate them south of side, urea, hydrazine. We can intercalate cations uh, like lithium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, aluminum, different valences you can intercalate and this is very important. Intercalation in general is very important for applications like energy storage or um, also sensing or biomedical applications. So it, 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 for many reasons, intercalation is important application-wise, but also processing-wise it's important. And then this will appear clearly in the next few slides. So Maxine's surface has a very highly negative zeta potential. When you measure the zeta potential, you find here's examples of vanadium carbide and titanium carbonite, right? And we found that the zeta potential is highly negative, especially at the neutral and basic pHs. So what, what does this mean? It means that that's why, or this can explain why positive ions are attracted to the surface of Maxine. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, I mentioned cation. I didn't mention anions there because this is what we found experimentally. When you put Maxine in, let's say, magnesium sulfate, and you do EDS, you see magnesium, but you don't see sulfate. Um, so this explains why we get see, we see this positive ion interaction uh, or attraction to the Maxine surface. The other important observation here from this very highly negative zeta potential around neutral that uh, around neutral pH is that you can form a stable colloidal solution of this material in water or basic solution. So taking all these consideration together, that the Maxine can be intercalated easily with cations. And also they can form a nice dispersion in water. Here I decide, okay, let's, let's try to use this information to enhance the processing and the delamination process. So if you take titanium 3C2 or vanadium 2C or many other vaccines and you put them in tetrapetyl ammonium hydroxide, for example, what happens is just two hour, after two hours, a significant swelling in the lattice parameter, as you can see it here from the shift in the 0002 peak, and this shift uh, and this increase in the sea lattice parameter um, was actually observed in both cases here in titanium carbonitride and vanadium uh, carbide. And the delta change in the despacing was about 8.9 angstrom in the case of carbonitride, while it was about 9.4 angstrom for vanadium carbide. And if you look up the cation diameter of tetrapetyl ammonium, you'll find it's about 8.9 angstrom, which is very close to what we measure in here. So this suggests that we got the tetrapetyl ammonium cation between the layers. And when you have this significant big bulky cation interpolated between the layers, this causes significant swelling in the material. So we start with a powder like this, it has multi-layer that has accordion-like structure or morphology. Then you intercalate, you cause significant swelling. And then by simply shaking the material in water, you can separate the layers from each other and form this very nice and stable colloidal solution of machine in water. Even after centrifugation, you can still see it's a black liquid. And you can see here's a tunnel effect, proving that this is a dispersion rather than the solution. And also from here, you can see the TM image of shows multiple uh, flakes here on top of each other. And 
2D sheets, I mean. If you filter this liquid, you get a freestanding film that's flexible, that can be used for many applications, um, that like what uh, previous speakers from yesterday described and like other speakers will describe as well. Um, energy storage is for sure one of them, uh, sensing and others, and water purification. Um, this approach works for many, several vaccines, uh, vanadium carbide, titanium carbonitride, tantalum, molybdenum, and so forth. Most of the publication on vaccines since then has used this approach to eliminate vaccines. Um, it, it also doesn't depend only on the one single compound. It, I mentioned heat tetrabacillus ammonium hydroxide, but in principle, other um, organic or other large cations can do the same. So shortly after we reported this, tetrabacillus ammonium hydroxide was actually found to be very interesting and it does the job too. Uh, choline, for example, another thing, it can, it can do the same uh, job. So it, it's really a universal approach. Intercalating a large cation for significant swelling can really result in eliminating the materials readily. As byproduct of what happens is you see change also in the surface chemistry of maxine. So here's an example again, vanadium carbide, titanium carbonitride. You see the ratio of oxygen to ferrine almost one to one before this treatment. After the treatment, ferrine is almost eliminated completely from uh, vanadium carbide and from titanium carbonitride, significant reduction of the ferrine content. And this is a very important step toward controlling the properties of maxine, which is something that has been predicted since the beginning that if you change the surface chemistry of maxine, you can change the electronic properties and therefore change the electrochemical performance and the performance in many applications. So, okay, so now we know maxine can be processed uh, and we can use intercalation to process maxine and then achieve larger scale delamination. Um, I want to have a, another closer look about what happened in between the layers when you have an intercalant that's already there. And this is a, following a very interesting study by Michael Guido from Drexel. Um, they did a very interesting in situ humidity measurement for different cation intercalated maxine. And um, you can see here in case of magnesium, for example, which is a bottom um, row here, by increasing humidity, you have significant increase in the despacing. And this keeps the same regardless of what increasing more the humidity. The increase in the despacing or, or the CLS parameter after increasing further humidity beyond 10% is not as significant as the first step. Uh, while, for example, in case of potassium, you don't see much change, which is the top row as you see here. You don't see much change in the CLS parameter regardless of what humidity you have. So we picked these two examples and uh, by the way, the difference here, uh, Maxine has a CLATS parameter if nothing is intercalated around 19 angstrom. 24 angstrom suggests that you have about five angstrom change. And um, another from 24 to 29, it's another five angstrom, which is a, the shift you see for in case of magnesium going from 10 at 10% relative humidity, you see this uh, shift up to about 29 angstrom. So, this five and five angstrom change divided by two give you 2.5, which is now the change in the despacing, is almost equal to the diameter of water. So it, it was hypothesized in this paper that you form a double water layer in case of magnesium with introducing humidity, while in case of potassium, you have just a single water layer regardless of what humidity level you are at. So being at Oak Ridge with a neutron facility, it is a great facility to study any hydrogen contained material and water specifically. So we, we picked these examples of potassium and magnesium because there's very little sensitivity to humidity in those two cases, but there's significant differences between them. So in case of magnesium and potassium, in, in both cases, we didn't see much water in between the layers. So uh, this is a, again, a, work in collaboration with a large team from Oak Ridge National Lab, and we did in, um, um, neutron PDF analysis and quasi-elastic neutron scattering, and also we did the ab initial calculation, and then you, uh, this will appear shortly after. So what we found is the water content is very small. The water content does not support the idea that you form mono water, mono layer of water or double uh, 
layers of water at all. So looking at the STM images um, for these materials that has been vacuum annealed because it's high vacuum in case of STEM, uh, we get a despacing of the dry state in, in case of uh, potassium it's around 23 and in case of magnesium around 20. And we uh, did the uh, uh, Paul Kent and, and with Wavy Sun uh, did the calculation and found that the lattice parameters they get from theory is comparable to what we get from the experiment in case of nothing integrated but just the cation. When we have cation with water, we started to put water with Maxine, just the amount we got from the neutron PDF, we quantified from the neutron PDF, we start to introduce into the structure. And this now is a mixture of DFT, DFT and molecular dynamic calculations. And we can see that in case of titanium carbide, we get a lattice parameter of 22.4, which is close to what experimentally we got around 24. And in case of magnesium, the water can form a pillar around the the magnesium cation, and this can get a sea lattice parameter around 25, 29 angstrom, which is almost the same as what we got experimentally. So this suggests that in case of um, titanium carbide, which is potassium, you see the water is staying in plane with the cation, while in case of the magnesium, they um, form a pillar around the magnesium. And now we have this material that does not need lots of water to cause significant increase in the despacing. And I, I remember this paper by um, Hu et al, um, that they reported the conductivity of Maxine is actually can change dramatically while if you push the layers closer to each other or you pull the layers away from each other. So for example, in, in case of four here, they pull the layers away from each other and it has the lowest conductivity compared to three, uh, here that they have, the, they push the layers closer to each other. For sure, the highest conductivity in case of one, which is when it's measured in plane, not out of plane. So now we have this material that was small addition of water can cause significant increase in the spacing. And this increase, significant increase in the spacing is expected to cause change in the conductivity too. What about the dynamics? And we, we looked at using quasi-elastic neutron scattering and we found that uh, a water diffusion coefficient when you have potassium interclase and maxine is about 10% uh, of that when you uh, don't have potassium, which is 50% of bulk water. In all cases, 5% um, of bulk water is significant diffusion. So water can diffuse in and out of the structure very easily uh, in these systems. So with all these qualities of water diffusing in and out very easily, significant change in conductivity with small amount of water, significant change in the despacing with small amount of, um, of water, this suggests this material that can be used for sensing. So let's test this. This was in a collaboration with Ilya Ivanov um, at CNMS at Oak Ridge at that time. And we found that yes, um, here when you have potassium intercalated or magnesium intercalated, when you start introducing humidity, you see a big jump in the resistance and this you can fit it and you can um, get the value you can use this material as na sub nanogram sensors for humidity um, beyond the humidity and sensing also intercalation can help the electrochemical performance so for example here this is work um, nina box group at oak ridge national lab um, so here we intercalated potassium in between the layers of maxines, then we try to use this electrode for magnesium sulfate electrolyte. If you don't pre-intercalate potassium, this is the capacitance you get, the black here, the capacitance you get for the magnesium sulfate electrolyte. If you pre-intercalate potassium, you get higher capacitance when, uh, when, you when you cycle it in magnesium sulfate electrolyte. And the reason for that, when you look at the AFM images here, and this is the estimated the youngest model um, stiffness here you see. Um, when you don't pre-intercalate potassium, you see areas are some colors very hot here, the red, I'm, I'm pointing at the image at not many negative 0.6 voltage. And this is where you see that you have areas that's blue and areas that are red when you don't have potassium pre-intercalated. And this suggests that you have non-uniform uh, intercalation happening. So 
what we believe happens that uh, when you don't pre-intercalate potassium, magnesium is a little bit big that it, it, needs, it, it doesn't penetrate in all the places uniformly. While in case of pre-intercalated potassium, I'm again looking at the negative 0.6 voltage at the bottom here, you see it's a much more uniform and you see that the magnesium is everywhere and this results in changing the elastic properties. That's why we are propping it with the elastic properties here. Um, so it's much more uniform. So potassium opens uh, layers and allow magnesium to penetrate very easily between the layers. Uh, so this is okay. This is just simple uh, change in the the spacing that allows ions in and out. But what about changing in the oxidation state? Does having cation uh, between the layer change the oxidation state of, um, of titanium in maxine, which is very important for pseudocapacitance application where the oxidation state of the transition metal is a uh, key. So here uh, in collaboration with uh, um, Tristan Bikit and his student Amir Tamimi from Helmholtz Institute in Berlin, uh, they have a synchrotron facility there. We wrote a um, couple of user proposals and uh, we got time. And um, here we run the X-ray absorption measurement uh, spectroscopy for different intercalated mixing. And interestingly, we found that the oxidation state is actually dependent on what cation we intercalated. And the larger the cation, the higher the oxidation state we have. Um, we believe this is related to the opening is a despacing and allowing more water to get between the layers from just atmospheric um, humidity. What's also interesting that we found after you soak this material in sulfuric acid, they all go back to one reduced oxidation state, which is very interesting for electrochemical capacitance and that we have actually some interesting results, but I'm uh, not ready to share them yet. Uh, we're trying to finish that manuscript. So, uh, but this suggests that the intercalation is not just changing the despacing simply, but also it's changing the oxidation state of the transition metal. Um, and with changing the oxidation state of the transition metal you, and opening the layers, you can allow for large capacitance in application beyond the aqueous electrolyte. It is an example that again, I will not be able to talk much about it because it's not published yet. Um, intercalated maxine with an intercalant X. And when we test it in uh, EMI TFSI, we find significant increase in the capacitance compared to non-intercalated maxine. And here, this is a multi-layer maxine. And by the way, multi-layer maxine, when you try to test it for ionic liquid, as you see here, you get very small capacitance, around 30 or something for other than, which is, that doesn't make it useful. Only you need to delaminate it. And not only delaminate it, you need delaminate it and to reduce carbon and the tubes between the layers. And then you can start to get decent capacitance, or you need to um, re intercalate it with ionic liquid, then you can start to get uh, decent capacitance, but this is all delaminated. But here, what, we are, what I'm showing is multi layer maxine powder. And we get a capacitance of more than 170 farad per gram. And here's a comparison of these inter pre intercalated material compared to um, ionic liquid uh, infused delaminated maxine. And carbon nanotubes, uh, spaced maxine, and macroporous maxine and oligraphene. It outperforms all of them, uh, especially at, at lower rates. Okay, so intercalation is important for many applications, uh, but having this redox active surface, and we found that intercalation can change the oxidation state of maxine. This all suggests that we need to have a, another look as well at what happened when you have a redox active surface with an in close contact with an intercalant. Does the intercalant stay the same or some changes happen to it? So here's an example for urea. Um, and if, if you hear the yesterday's talk and that Maxine can be used for dialysis and for our, um, portable kidney and this great work has been reported, but actually we did this work in parallel. We were not aware of the urea uh, for dialysis. We were doing this for more fundamental reason to see how does urea um, behave in confinement in these materials? So we picked uh, to a model system here, which is uh, uh, urea, um, tit titanium-based urea complex to compare it with Maxine. We know urea can intercalate with Maxine uh, from early on in 2013. And um, we found, okay, if you soak Maxine in urea at 60 degrees, 
we see a significant uh, increase in the despacing or sealance parameter. So we believe that there is something intercalating. And at that time, we were under the impression that urea itself is intercalating. So here we picked this titanium urea complex to compare to Maxine intercalated with what we saw with urea at that time. So here is the inelastic neutron scattering, and this work was in, uh, done at, at SNS um, in collaboration with um, uh, Sasha and uh, Steve Overbury. Um, so here a comparison for the urea alone, which is a black plot here from inelastic neutron scattering. This is where the vibration modes for urea, different vibration modes for urea. And for titanium urea, you see here, there are matching and in, in, in peaks position for where urea should be. While for urea treated Maxine, we don't have that exact match as what we saw earlier for the titanium urea complex. And for example, the peak here for NH2 or the, uh, the peaks for uh, and it's, yeah, the two peaks for NH2 around 1100 and 1300, they are not there anymore. So this suggests that we don't really have urea between the layers. We have something else, but what, what do we have? So yeah, so those are the main peaks features for urea that we don't really see in Maxine, but we see in the titanium urea complex. So what do we have? So urea decomposes uh, in water, this is the composition of water is known, but it's known to be very slow. So, and, and as you see, the product of this composition, eventually you would form a CO2 gas. So can it be the case that we are really decomposing urea at 60 degrees and uh, we are forming CO2 gas and the byproduct of this decomposition is what intercalates? And so we did the um, IR measurement and we found that actually, yes, we see CO2 uh, signal increasing with time when we drop um, urea on, on top of Maxine and at, at that temperature and this significant increase in the CO2 content. So we really are forming some CO2. So we have some decomposition taking place of urea. And to check um, while this has any basic um, from theoretical point of view, we uh, in cooperation with um, Audrey Van Dyne at uh, Penn State we, uh, they did the REACTS FF and we looked at the system now for urea alone, and which is green here, and urea with water, which is red, and urea with water with Maxine, which is blue. You would see that urea with um, Maxine and water decompose at much lower temperature compared to urea alone or compared to urea with Maxine. Uh, sorry, urea was water. So, and also the number of molecules of NH3, which is a byproduct of this decomposition, you'll see is much higher for Maxine with urea compared to the other two cases. So, looking at, at the literature, we find that um, Halim et al. I, I, I was aware of this paper that when you uh, try to etch Maxine with ammonium bichloride, it results in intercalating of NH3 and NH4 plus. So. So, okay, let's, let's try to make this inter NH3, NH4 plus intercalated Maxine and compare it to the urea treated Maxine and see what we get. And here's what we got. We got almost the exact, this, uh, I'm looking, comparing now the black and red. You see here the peaks, the main peaks we see around 1400 and around 1700 exist in both cases. And the only extra peaks we see in the ammonium bifluoride etched maxine are related to the bifluoride anions. So this suggests that what we have intercalated between the layers is actually uh, NH4 plus and NH3, not really urea in our case when we did this at 60 degrees. So maxine can be a catalyst and it can catalyze um, the composition of whatever intercalant you try to put in between the layers. And this can change the, or should actually change the thinking of you put Maxine in a beaker with certain liquid or certain solvent or certain intercalant and you see changes in the despacing and you assume, yes, what I had in the beaker is now between the layers. It might not be the case. You might have something else due to decomposition because of this catalytically active surface, which could be useful. So it is a, it's not a bad, um, it's not a negative thing. It is something to consider. So with this very catalytically active material, it's like, okay, let's study it for, uh, as a catalyst. Uh, Maxine has been explored as electrocatalyst because it has electrically conductive and it is a very nice HER 
um, hydrogen pollution react as a catalyst, and also it has been explored in, in a few other catalytic systems. Here, where we're trying to use maxine for, as, uh, for hydrogenation for uh, uh, furfural and to furfural alcohol. I'm, I'm not going to talk in details about the catalytic system here. This paper just was accepted yesterday. Uh, but, and this was in collaboration with a group from Milan University, Alberto Villa, and for the calculation, this uh, uh, was done by Matt Nurek from the uh, University of Minnesota. So I'm not going to talk about details here, but I, I want to just pick something related to intercalation and talk about it here. You see, uh, when you compare titanium 3C2 and titanium 3CN, both of them have catalytic activity, uh, more than 100 millimole of uh, furfural per gram catalyst per hour which is decent activity for titanium-based catalysts for furfural, they, are, they usually don't have good catalytic activity. So this is about order of magnitude higher than what you get for titanium oxide, for example, when you try to use the catalyst. But what we found interesting that the titanium carbonitride is much more stable uh, compared to the titanium carbide. So you see with multiple runs, the catalytic activity of, of maxine in the case of titanium 3C2 decays significantly and becomes almost inactive after sex cycle. So why is that? So looking at the X-ray diffraction, we found that this stability in the catalytic activity is related to almost no change in the despacing in case of carbon nitride. And I'm looking now at the bottom X-ray diffraction, comparing the black to red here, titanium carbon nitride before and after reaction, we see almost no change in the despacing. While when you look at the top X-ray diffraction where titanium carbide, we see significant changes in the extra, in the D spacing for the peak, uh, 002 peak of maxine before and afterwards. So just something intercalate between the layers. And this intercalation that happened, it, it most likely intercalation of the pi protocols of catalytic reaction, that led to deactivation of the surface. So why in case of titanium carbon nitride, we didn't get this kind of intercalation, negative intercalation in that case, while in case of titanium carbide, we got this negative intercalation that results in the activation. Actually, in fact, if you look at the end set and compare the two end sets of those two X-ray, you will see the 002 peak of the maxine before even the reaction here at eight degrees for titanium carbonite, right? And at around nine degrees for titanium carbide, which is actually suggests that the titanium carbonite right, is already pre-intercalated with something because the, as max phases, they all have almost, almost the same C-last parameter. So this suggests that titanium carbonate is already pre-intercalated. And in another study we published this year, uh, using NMR and neutron and ab initio calculation and DFT, we found that yes, maxine carbonitride has a aluminum uh, cation intercalated between the layers. And apparently this aluminum cation that's intercalating is gluing the layers together and preventing further swelling of the structure and further intercalation of uh, catalytic uh, reaction products in that case. And that led to the activation. Um, another very quick example, I know my, I'm running out of time. Um, this is another paper. This is a work uh, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Volker Preisser at the INM Institute in Germany. Um, so this, in that case, this is a just, again, just accepted yesterday too. Um, this is ionic liquid based synthesis of Maxine. Um, I think Michelle talked about, uh, about in the opening remarks about the lithium fried HCl etching of Maxine which is actually a very interesting way to make in C to HF, and this results usually in intercalation of lithium. Here's the same idea, using, instead of using lithium fluoride, we're using um, emim uh, BF4, uh, which in that case, the BF4 hydrolyzes and may results in forming HF in C2, that results in selective etching of the aluminum layer. And unlike the case of lithium for HCl, where you intercalate lithium, here we intercalate um, the emim cation which can be very useful for ionic liquid, for example, or for other applications. So what I want to say from this is you can design the sensors to end up with an intercalant that you need for target application. So just not, the goal is just not to make Maxine, but the inter, whatever intercalated can make a difference, uh, as you saw. So to summarize, Maxine is a large new family uh, of materials and just I wanna, say one, one sentence intercalation maxine is way more complex than it first appears that just you put something in and you space the layers a bit, a bit from each other and that's it. Um, I, I would like to thank my, my group members here at Tulane and I would like to thank my collaborators at Oak Ridge because 
most of or like ha about half or, or more of this work was done at my, during my time at Oak Ridge and my collaborators at the Helmholtz Institute of Berlin at Penn State and Milan and Minnesota and uh, at Einem Institute and for sure the funding uh, from Wigner Fellowship when I was at Oak Ridge uh, and also from the first center when I was at Oak Ridge and when, now when at Tulane and the fund from Tulane too. Uh, with this, thanks for your attention and I'm ready for any questions. All right. Um, thank you, um, Professor Nagib, for the really beautiful and, and inspiring talk. It's wonderful to hear uh, back to those very initial experiments and to hear that story. So we've received a very large number of questions, and I apologize right up front if we don't get to your question. I think this just shows the enthusiasm and interest in the, in the area. Um, so let me just go ahead and get started right away on the questions. So first, you were talking about the colloidal solutions uh, near the beginning of your talk. What determines the highest possible concentration uh, for colloidal solutions of maxines? That's, that's a very good question. Um, so it, it, it can be related to the zeta potential of the layers. Um, the, the higher the zeta potential or, or the highly the negative zeta potential, the more they can stay in, in stable colloidal solution right before sedimenting. Um, also the efficacy of, of the delamination process. How much do you have intercalants that cause significant swelling, breaking the hydrogen bonding and allowing them to separate from each other? Uh, this makes a difference. So sometimes, for example, you start with one gram multi-layer maxine and you get only 0.1 gram delaminating maxine with certain delamination approach. With other delamination approaches, you might find yourself getting half a gram of delaminate maxine or even 0.7 gram of delaminate maxine. We have uh, work that's unpublished yet that, that we are getting very high uh, percentage of delaminate material. Then the redispersion, after, after you have this large amount of delaminate material, you can redisperse in principle and you can get very large um, concentration, 30 milligram per milliliter, even liquid crystal, um, a group from Australia published a very nice paper on liquid crystals of maxines very high concentration can be achieved um, after, after delamination. Okay, so we had a number of questions also related to the intercalation, you know, the, the, the large part of your talk on intercalation. Um, first, what happens to the overall maxine stability um, if, after you've inserted these cations? Yeah, very good question. We noticed from uh, our solution TM that it, it depends on the treatment. You can be aggressive and this would make lots of defects in the material. Uh, so for example, if you soak it in this, let's say tetraptyl ammonium hydroxide for a very long period of time, you will have significant amount of defects, holes, vacancies. Uh, while if you do it only for a short period of time, this can reduce the defect uh, density in that case. Um, so yeah, this, it, it's, it, is a, it is a factor that you need to be aware of while you're doing this synthesis. Yeah. Um, you discussed a bit about putting the, the intercalation process. There was questions about the deintercalation process. Um, are there any methods to, or, or processes to go about taking the intercalated ions out uh, once they've been intercalated? Yeah, yeah. So um, if, if we're talking about the multi-layer, there, there has been lots of work done on ion exchange by Michael Guido at Drexel, and I think his entire PhD thesis is, is around the theme of ion exchange, which is very nice work. So you can replace, let's say, um, lithium by proton. You can replace proton by tetrabutyl ammonium. You can replace tetrabutyl ammonium by another cation. Yes, absolutely, you can exchange ions. Uh, but if you are asking, can you get rid of completely of whatever intercalated? In principle, yes. So if you take, let's say, the tetrabutyl ammonium uh, example or tetrabutyl ammonium, if you do vacuum annealing at enough high temperature, you can decompose this and get rid of it completely. So, yes. And, and finally, related to that topic, we had a number of questions about how these intercalants affect the performance, in particular, say, the electrochemical performance. So, for instance, um, there could possibly be charge inversion on the max seen sheets. Um, does the change in surface properties induced by these intercalants, does that affect capacitive performance, or um, are there any other changes to the performance in terms of catalysis or energy storage? We, we do see changes, and um, I, I, as I, say, I, I showed what very quickly a uh, slide on some unpublished work, uh, we see significant change on the capacitance, for example, when we test the ionic liquid. 
I didn't mention what intercalant was in that case, but it is an intercalant between the layers that results in about order of magnitude higher capacitance uh, from before intercalation and after intercalation. Uh, also, the same idea for aqueous system, um, having these cations that I showed that results in changing the oxidation state of the titanium. When we test this in, in aqueous electrolyte, we see much better performance compared to non-intercalate. So it does have an effect. And this effect can be negative effect as well. I, what I mentioned are the positive effects, which we were interested in. But it can be negative effect, as I mentioned, for example, in case of the activation of the catalytic uh, uh, reaction. Right. <laughs> Um, we also had a number of questions uh, kind of related to sort of techniques and uh, tricks in, in terms of working with maxines. Um, so for instance, when you do the, the transition from a max phase to the maxine phase during that synthesis, um, can you compare the pros and cons of using max phase precursor that was sintered by HIP versus uh, pressureless sintering? Or, and just any other thoughts related to how the, the starting max phase uh, influences the, the final maxine? I really like this question and it is something that has been overlooked. People are, are there, there's just a paper published last week um, saying one max phase and different maxines, which I found very interesting. Yes, you can have the same max phase, but you can get different maxines depending on the starting senses of the max phase. And I, I believe also Yuri published a paper on changing the precursor, not even the census technique. It's different carbon sources, uh, different performance, different behavior of maxine. Yes, we, we need to pay more attention on how we make the max phase powders, and the, then you will get slightly different maxine. I can't comment on exactly what the difference would be between high, uh, HEP or, or uh, pressureless centering. Uh, what I can tell you, it's easier to use the pressureless centering to make powders out of it. Um, but I, I can't really, I, I, I don't recall um, studying this in details to give you a clear comment on the different properties, but it is worth studying, absolutely. There were also questions related to the, the very nice neutron work that you showed. So um, is it possible to quantify the amount and the composition of the functional groups using neutron scatterings, scattering? And are there other techniques that are commonly used to quantify uh, those functional groups? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are many techniques you can use. Uh, when you get to hydrogen, the choices are limited. Um, but oxygen and fluorine, yes, you can have XPS, you can have even EDX, you can have many techniques you can use for the oxygen and fluorine. But when you get to hydrogen, the choices are limited. Um, NMR is one of them, mm -hmm. um, and then neutron is another one. There are a couple of more techniques um, that you can use. But to have an accurate estimation for the OH content in the material, uh, nothing can compete um, the NMR and the neutron. Yeah. Uh, there was a question related to the catalysis work that you showed kind of toward the end. Um, do you have a sense of if that is occurring or where on the Maxine is most catalytically active? Do you think this is on the surface or the edges or do you have any comment related to that? It, yeah, we, we believe it cannot be just the edges. It, um, it, we believe something is happening between the layers, and you can see this from the change that's happening in the last parameter of the titanium 3C2. Uh, so based on the calculation done by Matt Neurek at Minnesota, he, they found that um, what happens is actually in the beginning, because we do this treatment, this catalytic uh, test at 450 Kelvin and 5 bar. So this is a little bit uh, harsh conditions that we can replace some of the oxygen or can reduce some of the oxygen on the surface of Maxine and have either bare surface that can get hydrogenated quickly. And these are really the catalytically active sites. The OH are not the catalytically active. The bare or the hydrogen terminated are the catalytically active sites. Yeah. Uh, we may have time for one more question. So we received a number of questions related to synthesis uh, going from Max to Maxine. And, and because of course you have spent years doing this, maybe it's, it's fitting to end on one of these. And this kind of ties in with your you know, initial story about perseverance and, and keeping at it. So uh, we have a question about how to separate Maxine from precursor Max phase and, and binary titanium carbide. Um, so if you have a complete etch, incomplete etching reaction, um, any t tips or tricks on- Yeah, on so it's-, it's this is one, one simple thing is if you plan to do delamination, for example, during the delamination process, there is a centrifuging step you do. 
And during this infusing step, any max phase will just settle down very quickly and there will be no problem whatsoever. And you'll end up by just the 2D sheets in the liquid. So this is one way you can do it. And this can be simple and, and, and quick. If you plan to use multi-layer, um, maybe sedimentation uh, is, is one way to try, uh, but it's, it's less effective compared to when you do want to do it. And, and finally, is the delamination of the multi-layer maxine to single layer maxine, uh, you know, how does that depend on the size of the intercalating ion? Is there a strong correlation there? Um, there, there, is, there, there is a correlation. I wouldn't, I, I can't recall a systematic study uh, studying this, but there is a correlation that, um, for example, certain cations, if they are very small, they would not result in any delamination. Yeah. They are not big enough to break the hydrogen bonding and, and van der Waals bonding between the layers and, and cause swelling and separating from each other. So th this, is, uh, this, this would be one comment. The larger, the faster it can be delaminated. But also the larger, the harder it gets interpolated. So it, it is a, you need to balance this. You need to have probably a, uh, either a pre intercalant that can open the way a little bit to have the larger cation going after that, or you need to have a medium sized cation that can go and cause significant swelling. All right. Well, on behalf of Drexel University and the, the committee, uh, the organizing committee, we really thank you, Professor Nagib, uh, for the wonderful talk and taking part in the session. We're now going to have a four inter minute intermission to prepare for our next speaker, Dr. Babak Anasari, who's the assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Energy Engineering at Purdue, University, Purdue School of Engineering and Technology, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. So we will be back at 9.30 um, to hear from Professor Anasari. If you've ever heard your car engine rev through your radio while listening to an AM station in your car, or had your television make a buzzing sound when your cell phone is near it, then you've experienced electromagnetic interference. A group of researchers at Drexel University and the Korea Institute of Science and Technology is working on cleaning up this electromagnetic pollution by containing their emission with a thin coating of a nanomaterial called Maxine. Maxine was discovered at Drexel in 2011 and since then it's been tested in a variety of applications. But your first encounter with a miracle material might be in your cell phone. It turns out Maxine is also really good at dealing with electromagnetic interference. It's a solution that's thinner than paper, but it comes from volumes of leading edge materials research, and it's only happening at Drexel.
All right, welcome back. Uh, my name is Steve May. I'm moderating this morning's session. And it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our first keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Babak Anasari, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Energy Engineering at Purdue School of Engineering and Technology at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Um, before Professor Anasari's presentation, just a few logistical items that I'd like to mention. All uh, all uh, participants are in a listen-only mode for this webinar. Uh, if you're having trouble connecting to your computer's audio, please call in using the phone number listed on this slide here or uh, in your meeting invite in the email that you received. Uh, we would like our session to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions for the speaker uh, through the chat box on your webinar screen. You can submit those questions during the talk, and then after the talk, I'll go through uh, and select uh, questions to ask our speaker. A recording and slide deck will be available on the Maxine Conference website following the conference. Uh, and at this point, I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Professor Anasari uh, as our next speaker. Thank you, Professor May, uh, for the great introduction. And uh, let me share my screen that I can start. Sharing my screen now, going to presentation mode. I hope um, that everyone can see my screen. If not, please let me know in the chat box that I can go oh, and let me change my pointer to um, the laser pointer to get more feeling of uh, presentation. So um, um, thank you again for, for um, inviting me to give this talk. My talk would be on double transition metal maxines. And uh, before I start talking about the technical part of my talk, uh, I wanna also thank Drexel University and, and Material Science Engineering Department, not only for organizing this uh, 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 conference and not also creating this research field of maxine, but also having uh, basically specifically more for today for uh, training researchers around the world that now uh, we have all the speakers today, for example, and also part of tomorrow that we all did our either PhD or postdocs in the great department of material science and engineering. And uh, more specifically uh, with uh, Professor Michelle Barsoom and, and Yuri Gugazzi, uh, I did my PhD with, with uh, Michelle that I learned about max phases. And then I continued on on uh, my postdoc with uh, Yuri Gugazzi and then later on uh, research faculty under him and uh, where I, I got involved in Maxine uh, since 2014. And um, I have to uh, also mention that I was hoping to have um, results that I can present. Uh, it would be close to publication since I moved exactly a year ago to Indianapolis, Purdue School of Engineering. But because of the pandemic and, and shutdown, uh, I don't have anything close to publication. So I'm going to present the results that I uh, basically uh, worked on during my time at Drexel Nanomaterials Institute under uh, Yuri Kogatsi and the great team of, of DNI. And I'm thankful for all the funding that uh, uh, provided me at the time uh, uh, at Drexel with, with Yuri. And with that, uh, first I would like to start. Uh, so this is the, the uh, Maxine table that we have been uh, seeing uh, a couple of times in the past two uh, days. And uh, this is the, the most updated version where we have uh, different types of, of Maxines and the blue ones are the synthesized one. Now my talk will be focused only on these guys where we have two different transition metals as we call them double transition metal maxines. Overall, uh, this is something that in, on, uh, in the introduction, uh, Michelle mentioned about the periodic table of, of maxine that uh, by addition of the two weeks ago science paper published by uh, University of Chicago and, and their colleague, uh, now we can uh, claim that maxine covers the entire periodic table, reference terminations, and uh, when we have, uh, when we look at max and maxine, 
and also the interrelated species as uh, Professor uh, Nagib uh, nicely explained how uh, these cations can, can interrelate into vaccines and we have uh, a large variety of cations that have been interrelated or adsorbed on vaccines. And uh, we, uh, we know that we can form MBNs. So we have the whole periodic table uh, really integrated to the large family of MAX and vaccines. Now, uh, uh, MAC, vaccines all start with MAX synthesis. And um, for, for us, it is important to uh, know how we make these things as was mentioned and questioned in the previous talk and uh, Michael explained it very well. For this talk, the method that we use for the synthesis of all different types of vaccine is a pressureless reactive sintering where we mix elemental powder in the stoichiometric ratio and then we heat treat them or we put them at the temperature, desired temperature. For example, the famous TI3 ALC2 can be synthesized by mixing the stoichiometric ratio of titanium aluminum and carbon and uh, heat it to 1400 for and hold for two hours. And then we can make these two vaccines. All the vaccines I'm going to talk about have been synthesized by HF etching. So basically by HF etching, we can remove the A layer elements and, and mostly aluminum and turn them to vaccine uh, phases. Now, um, when we look at these phases, we only have one color. So that means that uh, they are only one type of transition metal. And when we look at one, or we call it mono transition metals, they, uh, there are about 11 vaccines of this type. For example, TI3C2 uh, or uh, TI2C uh, or vanadium, 4C3, niobium, 4C3, they're all in the mono transition metal vaccines. And um, now um, when, when we think we are saying that we have about 30 synthesized vaccines. So uh, the rest of them call, uh, come in the double transition metal form. And by that, I, we just simply mean that we have two different types of transition metals. I also refer to these as double M vaccine throughout the talk. So if I mention double M, I mean that where we have two transition metals. And when I say mono M, that's where we have only one type of transition metal. Now, double transition metal come in two different uh, forms. One is, well, when we mix two different um, metals, like many other uh, material systems, we have alloy. And the alloy is usually a random salt solution. We see the same thing in max phases, and this is something that had been explored a long time ago. And also in the Maxine form, this uh, the salt solution was part of the second paper published by uh, Michael Nagib, second paper published on Maxine in 2012. So uh, salt solution Maxine and Max phases are available. And here we are looking at all the possible composition that have been explored. The solid ones are the ones that been synthesized in the Maxine form. The horizontal stripes are the ones that have been explored in the max form, but their maxine phases are not synthesized yet. And these uh, basically uh, angled stripes are the ones that the maxine salt solution have been explored by theoretical uh, calculations. Now, uh, when we mix two different elements, in the max and maxine, we get a very unique behavior, which is not common in other material systems, or at least in most material systems. And that is, we get ordering. And to make these ordering, all we do, we just mix the elemental uh, um, powder, the stoichiometric ratio, and instead of getting a salt solution, what we get here is we get ordered phases. When we have two layers, we get in-plane ordering, as Professor Rosen explained it very well on Monday, the first talk. And then when we have been looking at the three or four layers, we get out of plane ordering where we have a type of transition metal, for example, molybdenum or chromium that is sandwiching a layer of another type, for example, titanium or scandium. The same thing applies for four layer uh, a transition metal max or maxine, where we have two layers of titanium being sandwiched with layers of molybdenum. 
as we said, all the ordering starts with max face. Uh, and uh, if you let me, let me just for a second, I change uh, my cursor that I can move the um, panel that I can see the top. Okay, now better for me um, that I can see the title. Okay, back to the presentation. So starting to make ordered phases, we need to start with ordered max phases. And the first ordered max phase was uh, discovered in 2014, where uh, uh, by mixing stoichiometric ratio of chromium, titanium, and aluminum, and carbon, in, in, by mixing a max and a carbide, but still the stoichiometric ratio was two moles of car, uh, chromium, one mole of titanium, one mole of aluminum, and one, two moles of carbon by heating to 1500, holding for one hour without any pressure under argon gas, uh, and ordered phases of a max phase was discovered. The same year, uh, we had uh, also chromium, vanadium, and chromium, vanadium in four layers that have been discovered. In all these chromium phases, what we have is the outer layer being chromium and the inner layer being titanium or vanadium. And they all discovered in, in 2014. Now, this is where uh, we got uh, more uh, interested in molybdenum phases because in 2014, that's exactly where uh, Michael Naguib discovered um, a lot of, of uh, maxine phases and that there was no molybdenum containing maxine. And the reason for that was uh, at the time, you only knew how to etch aluminum and there was no molybdenum aluminum containing max phase. So uh, there were different paths that we were exploring. Uh, for example, there's molybdenum gallium, so we can etch that. But at the time, we could not etch uh, um, max phase molybdenum gallium. So we were looking for how to make a molybdenum aluminum containing max phase. If you look at uh, the whole uh, table of, of max phase, there is no molybdenum 3 aluminum carbon 2. And there is no molybdenum 4 aluminum carbon 3. The same reason there's no maxine of such. If you look at the bulk structure, if uh, this is a bulk molybdenum carbide powder that we can buy from any chemical company, that um, molybdenum carbide powder in the 8CP form, they have an ordering of uh, ABAB in the molybdenum planes. Now, if you look at molybdenum 3C2 block in a max or a maxine, they keep the same structure in both. We have an ordering of ABC, ABC for molybdenum planes. The same applies for molybdenum 4C3. So it doesn't really satisfy what molybdenum is looking for when it comes to getting structure with uh, having carbon filling the interstitial sites. So the way we thought was, what if we follow the same thing that was done in 2014, it was the same year, that we introduced titanium in the stoichiometric ratio that we can have a two to one ratio of molybdenum to titanium to make this phase stable. And we were able to do such. To do it, we said, okay, we're targeting a three layer max, which is M3 ALC2. So we mix the stoichiometric ratio of two molybdenum, one titanium, one aluminum, and two carbon. We mix the elemental powder and uh, the whole process of mixing was explained by Michael Nagy uh, nicely in the previous talk. And then we put it in the furnace and we ramp it up to 1600 for four hours. This ramping was basically the, the ramping that we can do it in a tube furnace. And we did not change the ramping at all in any of, of the synthesis. So we just play with the holding and temperature and time. And we hold, we heat it to this temperature and time, and we were able to make a molybdenum to titanium aluminum carbon two. With the same method of mixing and heating uh, process, we were able to mix stoichiometric ratio of two molybdenum and two titanium, aiming for a four layer max or maxine, which is M4ALC3. And we were able to make another phase of ordered of having four layers, two molybdenum and two titanium. Again, I wanna remind that we did not change the processing 
temperature or time or mixing, we only change the stoichiometric ratio. And we were able to make these two max phases. Since they both had aluminum, we were able to do HF etching, the same method. Uh, this was done at uh, 50, 48% uh, HF at um, uh, 55 degrees C for 48 hours and we remove aluminum and here are all the high resolution STEM images that uh, show that we have um, indeed more uh, brighter elements in the outer layers representing molybdenum and titanium in the middle. After etching, we have this open structure representing a Maxine powder. The same thing for four layers and we published this in uh, ACS Nano 2015. Then uh, we are uh, collaborating basically again, uh, uh, Yuri's uh, collaborators, uh, Dr. Paul Kent at Oak Ridge National Lab that he will presenting tomorrow morning. Um, with DFT calculation, uh, we found that it is not limited only to molybdenum titanium. We have a whole variety of different phases of uh, molybdenum tantalum, molybdenum niobium, molybdenum vanadium, these are all based on DFT calculation. And it showed nicely the reason that why we are getting ordered and not solid solution. In all these phases, we see that the energy of formation for an ordered phase is lower than formation of a salt solution. So this is the reason behind why we are getting these ordered phases. So we are not really doing anything other than benefiting with the, from the thermodynamics, that it is a more stable phase and we get ordered structure in the max and then we can turn into maxine. Now, uh, by looking at all these possibilities that DFT predicted, we were able to expand the maxine family to ordered phases in 2015 and then followed by in, uh, in 2017 by Professor Rosen's group in Linshoping that they added in plane ordered phases in the two layer max, max or maxine and die vacancy. And now we see all these orange color, red orangish color um, are all ordered double transition metal maxines that we added a lot of possibilities and about um, 10 of these have been synthesized that they're all marked with blue. Now, you might ask, how do we know that they are really ordered or not ordered? Well, as I said, we can do it with high resolution uh, STEM, with neutron uh, diffraction, and um, also XRD. But uh, there is also uh, some parameters that play a role in, in this. And this has been published very recently in Nanoscale by Professor Rosen's group that they describe and uh, she, uh, uh, explained it very well also on Monday that um, there are um, many of these that can be salt solution or they have very small uh, energy change from salt solution to ordered and some of the parameters that play role in formation of ordered phases are the difference in uh, M and M, M, uh, these two which are basically representing the outer and the inner layers the difference in electronegativity should be large. So we have a large difference in electronegativity and that's how we get, for example, chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten, mostly possibility of having them in the outer layers and titanium, uh, uh, zirconium, vanadium, niobium in the inner layers. Also slight difference in atomic radio. Unlike the in-plane order that we learn about on Monday, here we don't have a large difference in the atomic radio of the two different M's. And also there should be a large uh, difference in electronegativity with the outer layer M and the A that bonds these in the max phase. Now these are all DFT calculation. What happens in, in the experimental? As I said, we don't have too many results and this is a, an open area for exploration, but we know two of these. For example, molybdenum 2, titanium 2, C3 and molybdenum 2, vanadium 2, C3. Both of these have been predicted to be ordered and we see that the, the change of energy formation from order to salt solution for molybdenum titanium is higher than molybdenum vanadium, which means based on DFT, it is more costly to make a salt solution. So we have better chance of having ordered phases of this guy compared to molybdenum vanadium. Now let's look at the experimental. When we look at the experimental work, 
uh, what uh, we did, and uh, this, uh, these two studies have been published uh, uh, from 2015 to 2020, but uh, they are very uh, comparable, meaning that uh, to make ordered phases of a max phase, this is not maxine, we are just making max, and as I said, when we have the max, we can turn it to maxine without any issue because we have aluminum in between the layers. So we are aiming for four layer max phase, and we are mixing two uh, stoichiometric ratio of two moles of molybdenum, two moles of titanium with one aluminum, three carbon. And we did not, we do not change these because we are aiming for a four layer. Carbon is slightly lower, but I put it three just for the sake of simplicity. Now, the same thing, we mix two molybdenum, two vanadium and uh, with the rest, and we synthesize both in the same conditions of 1600 for four hours. And based on XRD, we got, uh, for molybdenum titanium, we saw that we form a four layer max phase. And uh, the same thing applies that we get a four layer max phase for molybdenum vanadium. Now we said, okay, what happens if we increase the molybdenum content to 2.5 or even increase it further to 2.7? The same thing for uh, also molybdenum vanadium, increase it to 2.7. When we increase it, when we have molybdenum titanium, the whole structure become unstable and the competing phases become stable. For example, when we do increase the molybdenum content, we go from just a pure 413 to a mix of these two, and we increase it further to 2.7. Instead of getting a four layer, we get another type of max, which is a three layer uh, molybdenum titanium. So when we have an ordered phase, if we do not follow the stoichiometric ratio, we, the whole structure will, will change to something else. And here is another ordered phase of max phase. However, for molybdenum vanadium, when we change the these two ratio to higher molybdenum or lower molybdenum with higher vanadium, in all these four different stoichiometric ratios, we got exactly the same, comp uh, the same structure of molybdenum vanadium in the four layer form. So we see that there is really no change in the um, C lattice parameter of these two. And this is a closer look of the 002, the basal plane peak at 7.5 roughly. And we see there is really no change. There is a change in the A lattice parameter by introducing more vanadium or lowering the, the uh, vanadium. But for the ordered phase, we the whole structure changes. So we found that Although DFT says there's a chance of having ordered phase in molybdenum vanadium, we were not uh, able to make it and all the composition that we made form a salt solution. So now the question is, can we make these in the ordered phase or maybe these in uh, salt solution? The answer is yes. Uh, probably with post, I would say yes with like maybe uh, because uh, there are uh, studies that we can uh, do post-treatment, for example, heat treatment at higher temperature or maybe quenching from the uh, sintering temperature and see what we get at higher temperatures. And we look at these, by we again, I mean uh, um, uh, at URI's group with our collaborators uh, looking at different structures when we heat treat maxine phases to get uh, ordering to salt solutions. So we get ordered and we get salt solutions. And that's where we are in terms of different phases, as I mentioned. And uh, for example, molybdenum vanadium can be ordered, but so far we only made salt solution. Now, I explained all these, but you might ask, why do we even care about double transition metal? Well, because now the pair of transition metal, we can control electronic, magnetic, optical, uh, electrochemical, mechanical properties of Maxine. For example, on the electronic properties, looking at the three or four layers Maxine, all that we know or computational explored are metallic. But for the double M Maxines, the four or uh, three or four layers Maxines, they can be metallic, they can be semiconductor or semi-metal or uh, topological insulators. Here are our, uh, the, uh, the band structure of Ti3C2, the mono M, compared to moly titanium that we have a small band gap opening. Also, there are 
as I said, more predictions about being uh, ferromagnet semi-metals or semiconductors with more exotic phases like tungsten hafnium or hafnium vanadium that have been not synthesized yet, but they have been explored by computational means. Uh, in experimental, when we measured molybdenum titanium uh, resistivity versus uh, temperature, and compared with Ti3C2, we found that it is more resistive, but we did not see any semiconductor behavior. And we uh, relate that to having a mixed termination groups on the surface. Now we know with the new paper uh, published by University of Chicago in, in, uh, in science that we can control the surface termination. So that now can be a possibility to explore all these predictions by DFT. Um, more about the um, electrical uh, properties and conductivity of these molybdenum phases, Joe Halim published one paper in Physical Reviews in 2018 that uh, they described it very well about the conductivity. Recently, with collaboration also uh, uh, Professor May, we did soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy that we found that surface termination they have more effect on the outer layer, these molybdenum, for example, layers or chromium, compared to the inner layer titanium. So the electronic state of the inner layer does not really get affected by change of surface termination and only the outer. DFT calculations, uh, for example, by Dr. Kazai uh, that he presented on, on Monday also suggest that when we have double transition metal in the three layer form like molybdenum tungsten with these inner layers, they can with oxygen termination, only oxygen, they are being predicted to be non-trivial topological insulators. So that's another new avenue that we can explore for uh, non-metallic maxine phases by introducing double transition metal. Optical properties, we can control the optical properties as well, going from the well-known TI3C2 that has the green color to a change of color to by addition of molybdenum to uh, brownish red or even a gray. That I will not spend too much time because of the interest of time. And the last part is salt solution. As I mentioned at the beginning, salt solution, there are a lot of possibilities. But in reality, what we have made are only few phases. And as I said, this is not a new addition to the Maxine family. This is uh, part of the second ever published uh, Maxine uh, paper in 2012 that uh, chromium vanadium salt solution was explored. There are many more that can be synthesized now with uh, that we already have the max phases and with the new method of molten salt uh, etching that uh, Professor Ching Huang and Patrice Simon and their colleague published in Nature Materials. Now we can etch other phases of max phase that do not have aluminum, so which gives possibility of making novel uh, salt solution maxine phases, including manganese containing phases. Now, uh, one unique feature of salt solution is that we not only can target specific composition, we can look at the whole spectrum of salt solution. And that's something that uh, Yuri's group started doing in uh, the past uh, two years. And that is looking at, uh, for example, uh, titanium vanadium a two layer or titanium niobium salt solution, looking at the whole full spectrum, meaning going from a pure TI2C to pure niobium 2C or pure vanadium 2C and changing the composition. These changes in composition are made in the max phase. So these are the starting ratios. But because we see optical properties changes, as well as electronic uh, conductivity measurement uh, changes, or even electromagnetic interference shielding uh, behavior changes, we, we believe that this, we, it corresponds to the Maxine also as well, that we see that we have a whole uh, really change of, of optical properties going from uh, TI2C that has this winish red to uh, vanadium with this green uh, color or niobium with the blue color. And we go on the whole full spectrum and change the conductivity as well. So I wanna wrap up my talk by uh, just looking at the future of this double transition metal uh, family of Maxine 
there are more than 50 ordered phases being predicted, but only 10 being synthesized. So there are a lot more that we can look into. And with that, we can tune the properties of, of uh, maxine and max phases. And uh, when we get to the maxine phase, in, in bulk, for example, salt solution might not really change the, the properties of uh, max, but it will affect the maxine properties. The same thing for salt solution. We, have, we can fine tune properties by using salt solutions. And uh, even in the computational calculations, we don't have that many that even for a uh, theoretical group, they can work on, on this topic as well. There are several double M that in the max form that I, I marked uh, with uh, the horizontal stripes that yet to be etched to maxine. And all of these talks that I mentioned, the only focus was on carbon. Nitrite phases, carbon nitrite, they're open area for exploration for this double transition metal. And with the tunable surface termination, we can go from metallic to semiconductive or even insulating, topological insulating phases that we can explore from this large family. Before I finish, I also want to mention nanoartography, which is a, a sciences art competition that is open to everyone. This is a tradition that we started in 2016 at Drexel Nanomaterials Institute, and we are continuing. So if you're anywhere in the world, you can submit your image today to nanoartography.org, and there's a chance of winning 700 uh, or different cash prizes that it will get to you anywhere you are in the world. So uh, send your uh, images. We know Maxine images can create beautiful uh, SM images that you can colorize. So you can submit those to win nanoartography. With that, also, I would like to thank my uh, research group at IUPUI, uh, specifically Brian Wyatt, Kartik Nemani, and uh, Wei Cheng Hong, who uh, put this, uh, all the schematic and new tables of uh, double transition metal vaccines that will be published in MRS bulletin. So if you're interested in all these schematics or slides, uh, you can uh, get the, the manuscript from uh, my website, which is uh, babakenosuri.com. And uh, always we have Maxine book that you can, you can use. And with that, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. All right, thank you for the really wonderful talk. We have lots of questions and not nearly enough time. So let's just jump right into it. Um, we have a, a number of questions about the multi M and the ordering. Um, is there anything that stops or, or do you know of any research ongoing into moving beyond two M site elements and, and multiple, even multiple M site elements. Yes, yeah, so um, that is something that uh, right now we are working on and hopefully we'll have uh, some uh, uh, publications out very soon on uh, going how we can and is it possible to go beyond uh, more than two elements. And uh, there is always, there are uh, many parameters to consider, but that's hopefully uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about it uh, for sure in the next Maxine conference. Great. So we also had some questions about the properties of these uh, double M. Um, you touched on a bit of this, but um, maybe you could comment on electrochemical energy storage and oxidation stability of double M versus single M Maxines. Yes, so electrochemical, it depends on the type of, uh, the, uh, mostly the outer layer. For example, uh, there is, I, I did not mention, uh, for example, uh, the electrochemistry because of the interest of time, but we have uh, in the molybdenum vanadium, we, we looked at different composition of the salt solutions that when we have more molybdenum versus more vanadium and how the, the potential window changes based on these. In terms of uh, a single uh, in-plane order, also Professor Rosen mentioned, and some of these we discuss it in the manuscript uh, at the uh, MRS bulletin. So uh, if anyone is interested, feel free to download the, the manuscript to learn more about the electrochemical. Uh, and in terms of uh, stability, it depends on the flake size, like any of uh, the Maxine uh, phases, and also the type of transition metal. So if we have vanadium, for example, in the outer layer, that will oxidize very quick. But if you have more molybdenum on the outer, it is more stable compared to uh, vanadium containing. They're all less stable compared to Ti3C2, and that's mostly because of the harsh method of 50% HF and then delamination. Right. We had a number of questions related to synthesis, so maybe I can kind of touch on some of those. Um, I wonder if you can comment on 
if there's alternative maxine synthesis methods that don't originate from max phases. So, or, um, since, for instance, like MBE, CBD, ALD, or, or any of these possible, or is this not really feasible because the maxines are sort of metastable? Yeah, so the, the form that we are talking about with surface termination and, and the single layer, that uh, mostly we need to have these uh, precursors because uh, the uh, cubic or bulk structures are more stable when we synthesize them. But there, in the order, in the double transition metal, we can switch from a single element. I did not cover this in, in this talk. We can switch from single element by introducing more transition metal. And that's something that was published on the nitride phases in 2020. So we can go from a single element to multi element by just starting with Mac, Maxine phases. Ah, great. Um, and maybe we have time for one more question. This was something that was also asked to the previous speaker, but we didn't get around to. You know, a number of institutions, there are restrictions on HF. So related to synthesis, I wonder if you could comment on um, other etchants uh, don't involve HF or how to get around this HF issue kind of just broadly with, with Max. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think as uh, the Maxine research is expanding, there are many new methods, uh, including the, the molten salt method that uh, has been published in 2020 in, in Nature uh, Materials. Professor Ching Huang, uh, I think, uh, touched upon that on uh, his talk on uh, Monday. Uh, so that's one method that we can do molten salt and that uh, is more versatile in comparing to just HF that only uh, so far we can etch aluminum. Also, we can do a uh, mix of, of salt with different types of acids uh, with HCl. That is something that uh, we have not any report of doing etching for double M, but we know HCl, H, uh, LIF or um, these uh, salts work on TI3C2 or, or some other single element. That's something that we are working on to expand it to double M as well. All right. Fantastic. Well, I again want to thank uh, you, Professor Babak Anasari, for your wonderful talk and taking part in this session. We will now have another four-minute inter intermission, and after which our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Vadi um, Vadim Moshalin from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. So that talk uh, will commence at 10.10 uh, 10 Eastern time. Drexel is the modern American research university. We do translational research, we do cooperative education, we do urban extension. The place is just bursting with opportunity and as a result, it's a very, very special place full of great people who are doing amazing, amazing things. And the ethos of Drexel to learn by doing is really 100% compatible with what a comprehensive research university is and has to be. That experiential learning is essential and really, differentiates our students from the pack. Research is really just about discovering new things, trying to create knowledge, uh, insight, innovation in all forms. We bring together students, faculty, and staff from across the university to pursue highly multidisciplinary projects. So that can be music and engineering, that can be robotics and dance performance, that can be material science and fashion design. The things that have happened here and the speed at which they've happened is a tribute to a community that will never rest on its laurels. Everything that I'm doing now, trying to make the world a better place, my mission is to change the world, but I'm going to do it one student at a time, one innovation at a time, one class at a time. Every interaction, I want to make a difference in this world, and it's wonderful to be able to do that here at Drexel University.
Welcome back. I am your moderator, Steve May. Um, our second keynote speaker for this session is Professor Vadim Moshalin, who is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, before um, he gives his talk, just a few logistical items that I want to mention. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you are having trouble connecting to your computer's audio, uh, there is a phone number here that you can call into um, uh, to access the audio for the presentations. Uh, we would like our session to be interactive, so I really encourage you to submit questions throughout the talk uh, for the speaker uh, within the chat box that's on your webinar screen. I can see those questions, and then I'll pull from those questions during the question and answer session. A recording and slide deck will be available on the Maxine conference uh, website following the conference. And with that, I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Vadim Moshalin um, uh, to, to, as the next presenter. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve, for uh, the uh, introduction. And uh, let me share my screen now. Uh, so good time of the day, uh, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk today, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, but even more so for uh, running this uh, wonderful event uh, very smoothly. So thank you to all people behind the curtains. And with this, let me start with uh, the subject of my talk, which will be related to chemistry of vaccines and its use for uh, application development. Uh, so, uh, as we all know, uh, the family of vaccines is huge. And uh, for me, uh, as a chemist, I'm in chemistry department here at Missouri s &T. So for me, as a chemist, it's a big playground uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, chemistry games. So when I look at this table from uh, Babak's paper, uh, what impresses me is first of all, the variety or variability of elemental composition of uh, these vaccines, but also <clears throat> uh, their surface. If you look closer at the surface of vaccines, you will find that there are many functional groups which you also can play with. So again, as I said, it's a huge uh, playground for a chemist. And this is what we are trying to do in my group. Uh, historically, uh, surface chemistry was the first aspect of vaccine chemistry that uh, researchers paid attention to. And you can imagine different situations where surface chemistry of uh, vaccine is important, starting from uh, dispersion of vaccines, of course, uh, dispersibility of vaccines in different uh, media largely depends on their surface chemistry. And uh, in this uh, chemistry of materials paper we published, uh, few years ago, we demonstrated uh, that the optimal solvent for vaccines, for example, should have high polarity and high strengths of uh, non-specific dispersion interactions. But it all depends on the surface chemistry of material. Uh, another scenario where surface chemistry is important is, for example, for sensing. Now there is uh, an increasing uh, number of publications related to use, uh, using vaccines for sensing. And of course, the first thing that your analyte, the compound that you want to uh, detect, the first thing that it sees is what is on the surface of, of your uh, sensor, of your sensing material. And the affinity of your analyte to uh, the sensor will largely also depend on its surface chemistry. So it's not surprising that people wanted to modify surface chemistry, especially since there, was, uh, there were also theoretical papers, uh, which uh, Mohamed Kazi covered some of them and, and Paul Kent will cover more uh, later, uh, that predicted uh, uh, huge possibilities in uh, tuning electronic properties of vaccines by simply adjusting surface chemistry. So uh, since, uh, what is it, uh, five years ago uh, when uh, uh, Drexel researchers uh, in collaboration with Oak Ridge did this work uh, using neutron uh, scattering and PDF analysis to quantify surface chemistry. So since that time, we knew that the surface chemistry of vaccines is very complex and it's very also variable, depends on so many factors, on synthesis uh, procedure, on storage conditions and so on. Uh, 
so at that time it became clear that you know practically to uh, modify surface chemistry and experiment uh, will not be an easy task and then last year uh, another paper in acs nana uh, also theoretical paper uh, showed that actually uh, whatever you do using uh, pH and temperatures, which are most commonly used factors or were most commonly used factors to modify surface chemistry, whatever you do with uh, using those factors, you will probably always end up with a mixed uh, surface uh, termination because it's just thermodynamically more stable. So you will always be somewhere here, not in the corners of this triangle and uh, here, it means that the surface chemistry is mixed. So, <clears throat> and then very recently, uh, this paper in science appeared from uh, Dmitry Talapin group at the University of Chicago, uh, which actually uh, finally realized the dream that we had since long ago to uh, uniformly modify surface chemistry, convert it into uh, one kind of surface terminations. And uh, this is uh, very briefly how they have done it. So they used molten salts uh, technique and they started with uh, max phase produced maxine. And in this process, they also modified surface terminations with the uh, anions present in these uh, molten salts. And depending on the anions, you will get bromine terminated or chlorine terminated maxine. But the point is these, uh, halogen terminations can be exchanged later because they are quite reactive, can be exchanged for other elements. And so they also demonstrated uh, maxine, uh, maxines terminated with tellurium, with sulfur, or even with nothing. So bare maxine is also possible to make now. And uh, again, as uh, theory predicted since long, long ago, I just uh, quote uh, a sentence from their paper that surface groups were not just spectators, but actively contributed to uh, Maxine superconductivity. So they actively changed the electronic property of, uh, properties of Maxines. This is exactly what uh, everybody's dream was uh, after theoretical predictions. But uh, let me just go to the to the very first sentence here and, and say a few words about why they used molten salts. So in their own words, this is how they explain why they used molten salts, because molten, molten salts would eliminate undesired oxidation and hydrolysis. Well, oxidation and hydrolysis are the uh, terms which do not belong to the domain of functionalization that much as to the domain of uh, reactivity of the material. So they basically they uh, functionalized uh, maxines simply because they had some knowledge about reactivity of this material. Uh, sorry, wrong way. So now let me uh, make uh, uh, spend uh, some time to make the distinction distinction between reactivity and functionalization. So of course, what we want to do. Ultimately, we want to functionalize our materials, which means uh, we want by adjusting surface chemistry to uh, improve uh, performance of our material in application. So this is the purpose and definition of functionalization. Uh, however, reactivity is a broader concept, which includes all set of possible chemical reactions. So basically it's a concept which defines chemical behavior of material in a broad sense. Some of those reactions can be uh, undesirable and you will, would want to suppress them. And again, here's an example, oxidation, hydrolysis. Uh, you want to suppress them to achieve functionalization. So, but just pay attention that both functionalization and reactivity are very uh, uh, interconnected. And our progress in Maxine functionalization will to a larger extent depend on our knowledge of Maxine reactivity, of course. And so we come to two aspects of Maxine chemistry. One is surface chemistry of Maxines and another is chemistry of transition metal carbides and nitrides in their 2D forms or in other words, their reactivity. 
And what we were focusing here in my group uh, over the past uh, two years or so was exactly the second part. We were focusing on studying uh, reactivity of vaccines. Why reactivity of vaccines is important? Uh, because uh, it will be, uh, probably will be key in uh, different situations. Some of them are depicted here. So reactivity is important for fundamental chemistry of vaccines and also 2D materials in general. It's also important, of course, for functionalization as we have seen in this paper. Reactivity of vaccines is important for developing new ways of synthesis of these materials. And now, since we are moving uh, slowly to large scale production of vaccines, environmental impacts become more and more important and reactivity will play a key role in environmental impacts of vaccines. And there are already papers appearing uh, on exactly this topic. But uh, reactivity is also important for applications and uh, any application in which your material comes into direct contact with the environment uh, will depend on reactivity of your material. And those applications you can name, of course, catalysis, biomedical applications, electronics. And there is an example how electronic properties of vaccine transistor were sensitive to uh, uh, chemical reactions of vaccines and many others. So this is why uh, it is important to study reactivity of vaccines. And uh, uh, now uh, uh, there are uh, some new studies, uh, very nice studies, uh, which exactly explore this topic. And one of the most recent is this paper published in Advanced Functional Materials from uh, per person and, and Joe Halim and a uh, group in Sweden, uh, where they used in situ high resolution TM to uh, study uh, oxidation of vaccines with oxygen gas. And what they discovered is that you can oversaturate vaccine with oxygen uh, to the level where the molar fraction of oxygen in, in the uh, vaccine formula becomes close to 3.5 whereas the uh, traditional limit is uh, around two. So within this range of temperatures, you see from uh, 250 to 400 degrees C, the oxygen content is well above <coughs> the, uh, the limit uh, in vaccine structure. And yet the structure of vaccine stays uh, intact, so it still remains vaccine. Well, if you increase temperature further, it will collapse and form titanium oxide, which corresponds to this temperature. So it's a nice way uh, to study reactivity of vaccine and uh, oxygen is one, uh, of course, uh, reactant, but potentially other reactants can be introduced in uh, this in situ TM and uh, their interaction with vaccines can be studied. And they also discovered that, by the way, uh, water, uh, in maxine keeps evolving from maxine, which was subjected to prior defluorination procedure. And that defluorination procedure uh, <coughs> involves heating in vacuum at 700 C. So even after this heating in vacuum at 700 C, water was not completely removed and it kept evolving slowly, as you see uh, in this red curve, uh, step by step when they introduced oxygen to the system. So they call it chemisorbed water and this chemisorbed water uh, is not physisorbed water. And uh, the fact that there is chemisorbed water may be uh, important also for uh, uh, further uh, applications of vaccines. Why it always moves in the wrong direction. So <clears throat> we were uh, interested in particular in uh, reactivity of vaccines towards water. And uh, well, this is one of the basic well, you have to be careful when you say basic in chemistry because uh, then uh, basic acidic. So it's one of the fundamental chemical properties of uh, materials, their reaction with uh, oxygen, reaction with water. Uh, and this is why we were interested in this. And I think uh, common perception in the early days of vaccines was that, well, vaccines are essentially 2D forms of uh, transition metal carbides. So uh, we would take knowledge uh, of chemistry of transition metal carbides and just transfer it to vaccines without thinking much. 
And if you go to uh, textbooks, of course, the traditional knowledge about chemistry of transition metal carbides will tell you that they are very stable. They are insoluble in boiling potassium, aqueous potassium hydroxide solutions, in acids, in water. Uh, you need very high temperatures to uh, initiate these reactions. And they are more susceptible to be attacked by oxidizing agents. So I think that was uh, the common perception in the early days of Maxine uh, research uh, when it com uh, comes to their chemistry. But there was also uh, at least one paper published in Russian journal uh, Parashkova Metallurgia in uh, 1976, where the authors discovered that actually titanium carbide, bulk titanium carbide, at that time there were no Maxines, no uh, nanomaterials even. So bulk titanium carbide does react with water slowly and forms <coughs> uh, carb uh, hydrocarbons. And then in the end of the paper, they also concluded that the extent of this attack is small. It's limited by 30 atomic layers. And of course, who cares uh, about 30 atomic layers uh, when you work with bulk material? So for uh, years, uh, Virtually nobody knew about uh, this reactivity of uh, titanium carbide. <clears throat> and then uh, when we started to work with Maxines, well, this is something we all know too well. You produce Maxine colloidal solution, but then you have to use it quickly because your nice saturated dark colloidal solution uh, quickly turns into white suspension. Well, and you don't need to have much knowledge of chemistry to uh, predict that what you observe here in this suspension is probably titanium oxide, simply by the color and appearance of this suspension. And then if you don't trust your eyes, you could go and do more detailed characterization, for example, using Raman. And this is what you will see in the Raman spectrum of freshly prepared Maxine, you see mainly signals from Maxine. This is titanium 2C. Uh, but over time, the spectrum will uh, show more and more pronounced peak of titania, and eventually this peak will dominate the spectrum. So yes, you form titania from Maxine. So Maxines are unstable in aqueous colloids, and common knowledge was again from this experiment was that maxines degrade due to oxidation because you form titanium oxide. Oxide, well, what results in oxide formation, probably oxidation. And therefore common conclusion was that maxine colloids needs, need to be isolated and protected from air to be more precise from oxygen in air. And <clears throat> for a while people would try to uh, do whatever possible to remove dissolved oxygen from uh, the colloidal solution, purging it with uh, argon, deaerating it, with limited uh, success in terms of uh, improving uh, stability. And <clears throat> the tipping point for me was uh, when uh, we had these Maxine meetings at Drexel and students started to report that uh, also, when they disperse Maxine in alcohol, uh, ethanol, for example, uh, dispersion stability improves. So oxidation is suppressed. But for me, it made no sense because we know that if it's the oxygen which results in degradation of Maxine, so degradation happens through oxidation, then solubility of oxygen in alcohols, for example, in isopropanol is much larger. In isopropanol is 34 times more compared to the solubility of oxygen in water. Therefore, changing water for isopropanol should not suppress uh, degradation. It should actually promote it because we have much more oxygen uh, dissolved in, in this liquid and available for reaction with Maxine. And then when I moved to uh, Missouri s and uh, with uh, my PhD student, Shohan, we uh, started to look deeper into this. And we have done a series of experiments in which we dispersed Maxine in water and isopropanol. And then we saturated these dispersions with oxygen. So this is not air, just pure oxygen from, from a cylinder. And with argon. 
So the purpose of saturating it with oxygen was to increase concentration of oxygen as much as possible. And the purpose of using argon was to reduce the concentration of oxygen. And this is what we observe. So in water, when we saturate it with oxygen, well, degradation happens very quickly. For both maxines, we use titanium-2C and titanium-3C2. We observe uh, quite uh, fast degradation. When we deaerate water, saturate it with argon, then degradation slows down, but still you can see it. And then when we switch to isopropanol and again saturated it with oxygen or with argon, uh, we found that degradation is slowed down simply by switching from water to isopropanol. And it, it doesn't matter actually that much whether this isopropanol is saturated with oxygen or deaerated, saturated with argon. Degradation is slower in both cases compared to water systems. <clears throat> and for titanium-3C2, for example, even after four weeks, you don't see uh, any visible signs of this degradation. So that was interesting. And again, if you don't believe your eyes, you, can, you could go and do more detailed analysis and we used Raman spectroscopy. So this is freshly made Maxine, titanium-2C, titanium-3C2, freshly made in water and in isopropanol. And you see typical Raman spectrum of uh, uh, maxines, both maxines in uh, both cases, right? But then after a uh, certain time, so three days for titanium-2C2 is enough to basically convert pretty much all maxine in water. And again, no matter whether this water is deaerated or saturated with oxygen, all maxine is converted into titanium oxide. Whereas in isopropanol, the spectra stays almost same as uh, initially for fresh solutions. Same happens with titanium 3C2, although over much longer time, okay? So at this point, we were thinking that, okay, yes, maxine is unstable in aqueous colloids, but is it just oxidation that results in degradation? And then we did more detailed studies of kinetics of this process using UVV spectroscopy. And again, the conclusion was same, that for uh, both maxines, so this is titanium 2C, this is titanium 3C2, for both maxines, when they are dispersed in water, and no matter whether that water was deaerated or saturated with uh, oxygen, degradation happens much faster compared to the cases where they were dispersed in isopropanol. And for titanium 3C2, for example, in isopropanol, there is all literally no change in uh, the uh, absorbance of this solution. So it, it becomes very stable. Even when you saturate the isopropanol with oxygen and remember solubility of oxygen is much higher in isopropanol compared to water. So at this point, we uh, had to conclude that actually uh, the uh, reason why maxine is not stable uh, in uh, colloids, in addition to oxidation, there must be contribution from hydrolysis. So direct reaction between maxine and water. And therefore, maxines need to be protected not only from oxygen, but also from water itself, which means you, would better, you should better stay away from water as, as a medium uh, when you work with maxine. You can use alcohols or uh, other uh, non-aqueous uh, systems. And this is a schematic uh, illustration that at that time uh, Shohan has produced, which uh, illustrates that when maxine dispersed in water and interacts with oxygen, it can be uh, stable. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, when maxine uh, interacts with uh, oxygen, right, uh, in uh, isopropanol, it can be stable. However, when you place it in uh, aqueous environment, and if there is uh, even no water, uh, it will react and form eventually titanium oxide. But again, you should keep in mind that titanium oxide formed here is not formed by direct oxidation probably, it's uh, the result of hydrolysis. Now, you may be wondering why I make so much, spend so much time distinguishing between hydrolysis and, and oxidation. And you know, chemists are notoriously famous for uh, their love to uh, systematize everything. This is probably the most uh, known example. 
and also use correct terminology. So we still are publishing thick books, which basically teach you how to name things correctly. This is what we are famous for. But seriously, uh, chemical terminology is designed, when you use it carefully, is designed to capture and reflect the main characteristics of compounds in reactions. And for a chemist, for example, the difference between oxidation and hydrolysis may be quite significant. And uh, to uh, illustrate you why it's uh, always good to use correct terminology, I'm going to give you a quick example. So I will tell you that maxine degradation happens through oxidation. And then I will ask you this question, what would be the main anticipated products involving X element of maxines? So think ab uh, about it for two seconds. And I will tell you that uh, normally people would look at solid products of maxine degradation. And of course that is mainly M element oxides, but uh, there were not many studies about the fate of X element. And again, if I tell you that uh, maxine degradation uh, is oxidation, then this is what you would conclude then X element should form probably also oxides. And in case of carbon as X element, you would expect uh, CO, CO2. In case of nitrogen, you would expect nitrogen oxides and, and basically things like this, but they are all gases. And so our next step was to, okay, let's look at what we really form in these reactions. And uh, since we expected that X elements will form gases, we assembled this simple setup illustrated here. So basically it's a simple setup which allows us to collect this gas involved, uh, evolved in maxine uh, transformation reactions in water. So this is a colloidal solution of maxine and uh, it's enclosed vial. So initially the vial was filled all the way up to the rim and there was no gas phase in the vial. And then we insert this needle and immerse the other uh, end of the needle also in water. So this system is completely isolated from air, uh, but it allows uh, uh, for uh, gas collection and this needle releases pressure uh, when gas is evolved because liquid may uh, flow from this uh, vial into the water. So this is our setup. And indeed we collected in each of these reactions, we collected about half, half a milliliter, of one milliliter of gas phase. And then we analyze this gas using gas chromatography. Okay, so now it becomes kind of a detective story. So again, remember that based on the notion that maxine degradation is oxidation, we expect carbon oxides because our maxine here was titanium 2C or titanium 3C2. Carbon oxides are gases. So in gas chromatography, we expect to see two peaks and we kind of know that those two peaks must be carbon oxides. Well, we go and inject this gas in gas chromatograph and yes, we see exactly two peaks for all maxines we studied here. So what these peaks are, where is carbon oxide, where is carbon monoxide? Uh, well, to clarify that, we then take reference gases, pure gases and inject them. And we start with hydrogen, we inject hydrogen. Well, first of all, first disappointment it turns out that the largest peak here, uh, one of our two peaks is actually air. Our column cannot separate uh, components of air. So this is nitrogen, oxygen, all come as one peak and we always observe it. This is air, okay? What about the other peak? Must be one of carbon oxides, right? So we checked it and uh, we injected hydrogen. Hydrogen shows, uh, we, we, we see no hydrogen because the peak should be here. It never appears. Then CO comes next. Okay, so CO should give us a peak which is very close to uh, the air peak, but we don't observe it in any of our gases. So there is no CO, CO should be here. And then CO2 should give us a peak at around between 12 and 13 uh, minutes retention time. And we also observe no CO in all our gases. At this point, it, the story becomes very interesting because, okay, so we see air and we see something else. What is this something else? And we don't see any carbon oxide. So then we tested methane. And yes, it turns out that this peak that we observe in all carbide maxines, uh, in gas products produced by all carbide maxines is the peak of methane. So the only product that we can detect 
containing carbon uh, due to this hydrolysis reaction is actually methane. And if you are not convinced by GC, we also did another experiment in which we collected gas in, in a completely closed vial. So this is a photograph of one of our vials. Initially, there was no gas. Then we collect some gas and without opening it, we just do Raman spectroscopy through the wall of this vial and we record the spectrum and the spectra look like this. And again, all peaks here, well, this is nitrogen, right? Which comes from the air. And everything else here is uh, stretching uh, peaks of methane. And again, to nail it down, uh, students in my class do this, uh, quantum chemistry class do this uh, uh, as an exercise. Uh, if you look at the rotational part of the Raman spectrum, which is here, so it's zoomed in on this uh, right graph. So this is rotational part of the Raman spectrum of methane. Then you can measure with a ruler the distance between rotational peaks and that will give you uh, the uh, rotational constant B, which is related to the moment of inertia and moment of inertia is related to R of your rigid rotor and the rigid rotor is methane molecule. So R is CH bond distance. So this gives you direct estimate of CH bond distance. And yes, if you calculate it, it's 1.09 angstroms, which is exactly CH bond distance in methane. So by all means, what we observe in uh, degradation of uh, carbide maxines is methane. Now, what happens when we have uh, nitrogen in the structure of maxine? We studied uh, titanium carbonitride and uh, by measuring uh, solution pH uh, and also recording IR uh, spectrum of the solution, we discovered that what we have there is uh, uh, ammonium. We form NH3, which dissolves in water that leads to increase of pH over time. And this is the only maxine nitrogen. You see, it contains nitrogen. And this is the only maxine which shows this trend of increasing pH over time because all other maxines show decrease of pH. And then uh, we also confirmed it by IR spectroscopy because we see an H vibration uh, bands here. So when you have nitrogen in maxine structure, it will probably form ammonium. Now, uh, a little bit about a uh, story of uh, carbon, because uh, in some papers, you will also see that uh, researchers would claim that uh, carbon from the structure of maxine forms carbon, and they would write equation which has C in it, C, the chemical uh, symbol of carbon, right? So what does it mean? Is it solid carbon? Well, solid carbon should give you a signal in the Raman spectrum in this area, and we see nothing in the products of complete degradation of uh, any of these maxines, there is no solid carbon. And it also confirmed by EDX analysis. In EDX, the uh, atomic percent of carbon is C. So we see no C, uh, so to speak, in, in, in the, the solid products of maxine degradation. So carbon, it seems like carbon was completely transformed into methane. Okay, and uh, also these uh, studies of maxine reactivity, uh, I think they give us a nice opportunity to use maxines as uh, model systems for fundamental studies of reactivity of 2D materials because maxines allow us to separate and disentangle the effects of thickness from uh, the effects of composition, difference in chemical bonding and so on. Why? Because you can stay within the same chemical composition, for example, titanium carbide maxines, and change only the thickness, monolayer thickness of this material. So everything else stays same. Uh, composition, type of bonding, everything else stays same. So this family of materials gives you a unique opportunity to study chemistry as a function of only thickness of 2D material. And I think this opportunity was largely overlooked so far, and I hope we will do more about it. But here is one of the illustrations where we demonstrate that the uh, <coughs> reactivity of maxines is related to their thickness. So we studied kinetics of uh, methane uh, evolution from these different maxine uh, colloidal solutions. And we see that, for example, the thinnest maxine, titanium carbide maxine that we studied, uh, shows the highest uh, uh, rate of degradation, okay? Because it's thin. 
Whereas titanium 3C2, which has five atomic layers in the monolayer, shows much slower degradation kinetics. And then niobium 2C is an example of what happens when you change composition within the same monolayer thickness, because this is three atomic layer thick and this is three atomic layer thick, but the composition is different. Both are carbides, but transition metal are, is different. And then it results also in dramatic change of reactivity. So again, it's a very nice system to study the effects of either composition at fixed thickness of monolayer or monolayer thickness if you fix the composition on chemistry. Uh, and of course, we need to be careful about other factors such as, for example, uh, flake size. And this is what reviewers pointed uh, us to when we submitted this paper. And we analyzed the effect of flake size. Well, it turns out that for uh, all titanium uh, maxines in our work, the flake size was uh, virtually the same. But for niobium carbide maxine, it was actually smaller than for titanium carbide maxines. And yet, Niobium carbide maxine shows the slowest degradation kinetics. So it's a clear indication that the flake size does not play as much role as other factors, monolayer thickness or composition of your material in reactivity. Uh, and we also studied temperature dependence of this process and we observed that actually uh, maxines that are most reactive, so titanium 2C or uh, titanium 3CN, require almost no thermal activation and maxine that, which is less reactive than in 3C2 is very sensitive to temperature, which makes sense also. Uh, now I'm going to skip this part of the work for the sake of time, because it's kind of an old, and let me just jump to conclusions and uh, tell you, uh, so first of all, uh, take home message is that chemistry of maxines is not exactly the same as the chemistry of bulk transition metal carbides and nitrides. We actually observe in experiments that the chemistry maxines are more reactive and sometimes dramatically more reactive. So what we need for the future, we need more detailed studies of the effects of defects, of course, synthesis uh, procedures and post-processing conditions on maxine reactivity. We need to also have a better account of maxine reactivity when designing uh, our applications and synthesis and, and uh, uh, storage procedures. We also need in-depth studies correlating metrics of maxine performance in applications such as conductivity capacitance to direct indicators of their chemical reactivity. Because quite often you will see that people make conclusions about whether maxine reacted or not based on conductivity, for example. It may be not the uh, most sensitive indicator of chemical reactivity. So we need to uh, compare uh, sensitivity of these indicators to direct indicators of chemical reactivity, such as detection of products, for example, which we do uh, in our work. And in particular, biomedical applications need to be carefully revised uh, from the standpoint of possible vaccine reactions. And what's uh, in store for future? Well, more chemistry. We're just making first steps into this territory. And we already know that there are much more chemical reactions, interesting chemical reactions uh, of vaccines, which are not explored so far. And uh, also uh, what I want to see is uh, uh, also the use of vaccines as model materials because of this unique capability they provide us to separate effects of thickness from the effects of uh, composition and other effects. So uh, to conclude, let me thank my collaborators uh, funding that we currently have from NSF. And uh, yeah, uh, all of you for your attention to this talk. Uh, I'm, I will be glad to answer any questions now. Thank you. All right, thank you for the uh, great talk. As often happens when someone's talking about new and exciting results, we've, we've gone a little over time and we've eaten into through the question and answer session. I think that uh, Professor uh, Moshelin can see the questions that were sent through the panelists. There were a number of questions about methane evolution and such. And so um, I think may, maybe you can just send some answers back through chat um, um, as needed. But uh, with that, I again want to thank you, uh, Dr. Vadim Moshelin, for the really exciting talk on Maxine chemistry. Also, I, the plan is that we will not um, take an intermission at this point. We will just move on uh, to the next speaker in this morning's session. And our next keynote speaker for this session is Professor Maladin uh, Radovich, who is a professor of materials science and engineering and the director of the materials characterization facility at Texas A&M uh, University here in the US. 
Uh, before he begins his talk, I just want to mention a few logistical items. Uh, all participants are in listen-only mode, as this is a webinar. If you're having trouble connecting to the computer's audio, please call in using the phone number that you see on this slide here. Uh, we, would, we, we would like the sessions to be interactive, so please keep sending in your questions uh, during the talk. And uh, with time permitting in the question and answer session, I'll get to as many of those questions uh, as I can for our speaker. A recording and slide deck uh, from today will be available on the Maxine Conference website uh, following the conference. Um, so without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mladen uh, Radovich uh, as our next presenter. Uh, so howdy from uh, Texas A&M University and I would first like to uh, thank to uh, Michelle Barsoum and Yuri Gogossi for uh, inviting me to participate in this um, uh, very nice workshop. And it's uh, always nice to get back to Drexel, even um, uh, remotely like this in this situation. Uh, and uh, also a uh, special thanks to Danielle for really organizing perfectly this uh, um, and uh, switching uh, from face-to-face uh, -face conference to online. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk today uh, mostly about the mechanisms of action that we're looking at and uh, degradation or improvement of the, the uh, uh, oxidation resistance of uh, vaccines. And uh, this work is, has been um, uh, um, sorry. It uh, has been actually uh, kind of a summary of uh, uh, collaborative work between uh, three groups that started like, um, I would say probably almost five years ago. Uh, my group is focusing mostly on max phases and uh, vaccine synthesis. Then uh, Micah's green group that is uh, focusing on exfoliation and looking mostly on colloidal stability. And uh, Jody Lutkinhouse, a group that's uh, mostly focusing on how to um, uh, make uh, assembly vaccines uh, in uh, different devices uh, and um, uh, whatever vaccines um, we uh, give her. And I'm actually very happy to announce that uh, for many of you uh, know, uh, um, Abdul Jiri, he just uh, joined Texas A&M and he's been working on uh, nitride vaccines. So uh, we'll be uh, stronger for one more team member. Well, Adam, can I interrupt you real quick? Um, it seems that the screen sharing isn't working quite yet. Mm. Okay, let me try again. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry, Thank sorry. You. So this is the team, but of course, uh, the most of the credit for uh, everything I'm going to talk about uh, today goes to um, uh, I don't know why my next slide is not, doesn't work. Okay, it will goes to actually our um, uh, graduate students. And uh, this is a picture from uh, our recent uh, uh, weekly Zoom meeting. And also the students who already graduated in, in the meanwhile over the last uh, couple of years. So um, yeah, we heard a lot of the, uh, the over the last uh, three days already, and we are going to hear more about different uh, fantastic uh, potential applications of, of vaccines. And I'm just going to highlight uh, the couple of here that uh, we've been working here at Exos A&M, uh, mostly led by uh, Jody Lutkinhaus, uh, who is expert in uh, layer by layer processing. And we showed that basically, uh, if you have a very nice um, vaccine, uh, uh, a su a suspension, uh, oh, sorry, um, uh, colloids, we can actually uh, uh, layer by layer uh, process a very uh, conformal coatings uh, with uh, uh, on on different kind of the the substrates. So that those coatings are actually up to ninety percent of uh, vaccines, uh, and um, these are examples of uh, coating the nylon fibers, uh, different substrate that are basically uh, highly conductive. And what's even more important, actually, they can, uh, if they're coating on very, um, on polymers that are uh, stretchable, 
Uh, they can be actually serve as, as a high sensors that basically can be stretched for 40% without uh, uh, losing conductivity. And this process is quite repeatable up to 6,000 cycles. We can actually use it for, for uh, 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 stress sensors and or uh, we can use it as a humidity sensors, uh, those uh, uh, Maxine films. But uh, in my talk, I'm today going to focus mostly on uh, other two uh, kind of directions we've been working on uh, over the last years. This first one is to better understand uh, what, are, what is gathering um, and what are the limitations of uh, max uh, etching process of max phases to maxines and uh, also to understand better the degradation and oxidation and how we can actually prevent maxines, uh, maxine colloids from uh, uh, oxidation and degradation. So, so first, uh, when we were looking at the etching uh, back in 2017, actually, we tried to do electrochemical etching. And as we heard today, um, I think a couple of days ago, already, uh, you know, electrolytic etching of uh, uh, max, uh, max phases uh, has been done before. And it has been shown basically that it turns to uh, CDC. But when we look at more carefully with cyclic voltammetry results, it's shown here actually, we can see one step at about 4.4 to 0.6 volts. And uh, uh, that's actually associated for first removal from aluminum uh, uh, from electrochemical etching. And by electrochemical etching before we start actually uh, completely removing uh, titanium in a case of titanium to aluminum carbide. So we actually look at uh, uh, electrochemical etching and we chose uh, uh, intentionally a HCl, very, very diluted, which is uh, much less than what's usually used uh, the concentration of HI for etching, uh, chemically etching titanium to aluminum carbide and etch for different parts of time. And you can see at the SEM, this is initial. And we use actually highly porous electrodes about like a, a 50% porosity to actually increase the, uh, the surface area of the electrodes uh, significantly and observe uh, eventual etching. So if you look at from the SEM images, we can actually see that basically after one day and after five days, the etching process starts. After 14 days, actually we just end up with a CDC or, or carbide derived carbon on the surface. And it's been shown here basically that by SEM analysis, it has that actually the, by the etching time, actually the ratio of titanium of aluminum is decreasing, while after 14 days, actually both of them are etched out uh, and, uh, and those um, uh, lower potentials of 0.6 volts. Uh, uh, also the uh, XRDs uh, after, for example, five days, uh, yes, we, we get up strong peaks for max phase, but we can see characteristic peaks for maxines also. Uh, it's another evidence uh, basically that uh, be, uh, we are starting forming uh, also CDC is from uh, Raman shift results. You can see that it's instantaneously, actually, as we are etching aluminum, we start seeing actually formation of titanium to, uh, of CDC as a result of etching, electrochemical etching of titanium uh, uh, in some time. Uh, uh, so that basically uh, aluminum starts to etch faster or easier, actually. And another uh, evidence is that when you look at, uh, at very short uh, etching times, and this is one day, we can actually see that our counter electrode is completely covered with aluminum first. As the time increases, actually with etching, uh, we see, see titanium too. So all those results actually, um, uh, to explain all those results and what we are seeing, we propose a so-called the core shell model of etching in, uh, in uh, Maxine's where basically initially we start to match out first the weakly bonded aluminum but uh, after uh, some time of etching, actually titanium starts uh, to etch out, leaving the, the, the uh, CDC. And uh, eventually, you know, even with this porous electrode, when we basically crush it in the powder solicate, we can actually see the CDCs floating on the surface. And what we end up here are actually uh, mostly max phase particles that are covered with slightly etched uh, a, um, surface as it was shown in the SEM. So, uh, so basically this inspired us to look more in the 
in the in details in uh, etching uh, whether this concept of core shell etching or model can be applied actually to the uh, uh, other max phases in chemical etching in, in our attempt to better understand the whole process. And we, have, um, uh, we decided to focus on vanadium uh, 2 etching to vanadium 2 sig vaccines for the reason because this is one of the, the strongest bonds uh, and usually required the very, very uh, harsh etching conditions to get some vanadium to um, uh, C vaccines. Uh, there is an evidence as, as uh, Thierry O.C. Uh, talked yesterday that over etching basically takes place in their experiment. Uh, not only that there were some other evidences before, but this is really nice work where they showed actually on the single crystal, uh, looking at etching single crystal nanopillars, uh, so that we can actually see over etching similar to what we see in, 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 in the case of electrochemical etching. And the second, the last reason, which is going to become clear uh, lately, is uh, that basically the, uh, the vanadium vaccines are actually very, very unstable in, in the aqueous uh, collates. I mean, they uh, really turn to vanadium oxide very easily, as it's shown here. Usually, sometimes you cannot see uh, if there are still some unetched vaccines, they look black, but if you look at the longer time, and extract the, the solvent, you can see actually, for example, in this case, yellow color, that's basically from the dissolved, uh, mostly V plus, plus five uh, uh, species that gives you the yellow color. color. So th this one is uh, uh, quite uh, unstable. And these are actually usually two days or the etching time. These are actually uh, uh, equivalent to some of the etching times that we're reporting that you needed for uh, vanadium 2C uh, vaccines. So what we're looking at, we did actually very uh, systematic study looking at uh, uh, vanadium 2C vaccine. That was a process by uh, uh, furnace synthesis, reaction synthesis. We added uh, uh, for different times and look at the different particle size distributions to obtain so-called the vaccine clay intercalated uh, from that point on all the processing is uh, stays the same we intercalated with tbaoh uh, uh, so, uh, wash it three times uh, centrifugation uh, centrifuge <coughs> and then uh, did a bath sonication delaminate and uh, to delaminate the clay intercalated clay and then uh, centrifugation to separate the sediment from the supernatant and then we uh, freeze dry supernatant to get a solid to calculate actually what's the yield. We prefer using uh, as a measure of yield actually the solid of uh, supernatant that supposedly contains mostly maxine nano sheets as the best value to evaluate how successful our etching process is. And from the practical reason too, because in many cases we will really want to get single a few layers vaccine instead of for uh, uh, using a, a vaccine clay. <laughs> so when we look at this yield of a solid, we see actually that this is a very, very strong function of etching and duration, duration time, while actually uh, small particles give us a zero yield, practically almost zero yield with increasing the practical particle duration time actually uh, we are getting maximum somewhere around 30 time 30 uh, uh, hours so and this is a corresponding xrd from the solid in supernatant and solid in maxine clay and uh, i have to point out that we didn't uh, press clay here uh, or or a solid from supernatant uh, it's like uh, solids for supernatant is is freeze dry this is <coughs> so both are like on the vacuum filter filmed XRD to avoid actually uh, alignment vaccine that basically can give us a very, very high vaccine peak and uh, we can observe vanadium oxide or other presented species. But what's really important that we actually, in a supernatant, we see in vanadium oxide forming even in this uh, 8% uh, with, with the highest yield uh, vaccines. So we decided to really uh, etch that for a long, long uh, time for like 300, 336 hours. And as you can see, actually that it's completely changes color to blue. The blue color is more associated to V4 plus, 
which is more reduced than like uh, what we see normally in oxidation. Keep in mind that this is highly acidic environment. And then, uh, well, you know, the maxines don't look uh, like a regular maxine. And from XRD here, we can see actually formation of both uh, VO2 and uh, V2O5. Uh, so basically, uh, we completely over etch and form the, the oxide. So, but what's really important when we look here at a, at a, at a, at a particle size, we can see that basically we, even we have 20 to 45 microns, the distribution is not the same. So we decided actually, this actually indicates that uh, the, probably the smaller particles are going to uh, oxidize much faster as we edge them, giving us a small yield, the larger particles do not actually edge enough. So over the, this time, so uh, we actually display this to the smaller groups of the uh, see the powders to different particle sizes, and we can actually see the effect of the of the time on the different particle sizes uh, using the etching. Again, 32 to 38 give us the highest yield after 30 hours, and that yield increases up versus those on the smaller end actually uh, uh, give us like very small. Uh, insufficient difference in uh, 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 etching times. And at the same time, uh, what we look at here, we see actually in a super solid and supernatant the traces of vanadium oxide in all cases, especially in the case of the smaller particles. So not everything that ends up is our maxines in a supernatant. And now when we look at uh, actually solid from a supernatant, we can see that actually small particles are completely, uh, this is a uh, gives us a completely over etch mostly oxide particles in these two middle ages uh, ranges of the particle size at a comparable times. We can see formation of uh, some uh, uh, nanosheets. Uh, in the higher one, we can see also commission in nanosheets. And there we can see in a very, very large particles, mostly nanoribbons that basically gives us, and, and a lot of oxide also, some oxide present. So when we look at actually in more details, this is only uh, some of the of the XPS results. We can see that basically the the particle size that we start with actually affects a lot of uh, also the terminal groups. So when we look at the ratio of CVO to CVOH, we can see that in part in the smaller particles, most of the oxygen uh, functional groups are CVOH, versus that number goes up to CVO as we go look at the smaller particles at the same comparable part side. And also when we compare the amounts of VOX in uh, uh, versus uh, uh, CVOX uh, functional groups, we can see that that amount increases with uh, increasing time. So uh, the same is actually that even at, at a very, very large particles when we can get a good on sheet, actually we see slight increase of, of uh, VOX versus uh, uh, CVX. Uh, so uh, also when we look at very large particles, although they look, uh, uh, this is a clay after etching, they look very well uh, uh, etched out and exfoliated. When you basically do stonication and remove the uh, uh, maxines, this is actually what the sediment looks like. So basically it shows that we still in the, have in the same particles a uh, very un, uh, the, the unedged core that leaves because in SEM what we can see is only the surface of the particles, unedged core. And what's really important that if you look at the, at the, at the thickness of these particles in edge state and the core, actually they're becoming much, much thinner, suggesting that basically the, the etching on the uh, close to the surface because these are plate-like particles are actually faster. In, some, in many cases, we can actually exactly see something like this, where basically we have a core that's unetched and we have aluminum that we can detect in the middle while the surface is uh, very nicely etched. So all those results actually uh, uh, show that basically when you're do that core shell model actually also etching uh, uh, works in the, in the etching process where we have actually two reaction fronts. One is removing the A element out and the second front is actually that leads to the degradation or uh, oxidation to the of the of the of the max phase uh, or MX layers further, and uh, the, basically the rate at which it strongly depends on the phase or the initial particle size that we are uh, uh, using, 
uh, and also in the terms of probably uh, type of the vaccine, it depends on how easily you can add from MX phase uh, uh, A layer, uh, max phase A layer, or how you can actually easily oxidize. In the case of vanadium, where basically MX layers, vanadium layers are actually oxidized or react, degrade very, very fast, uh, that's very, very difficult to get a, a high, uh, high uh, uh, yield. So the other problem that we are looking at is actually the, the one of the, of the big, uh, I think one of the biggest problems or we think uh, of the uh, vaccines is actually their uh, uh, pure uh, uh, st the stability, especially in the, uh, the aqueous colloids. And uh, this illustrates as we talk a lot, uh, heard a lot about this in the last couple of days, especially in the previous talk by Vadim, uh, you know, when we keep uh, in, in the water and after a couple of days uh, or 20 days or 30, they completely oxidize. Uh, and this is very, very important uh, uh, to, uh, for if you wanna keep, for example, longer shelf lives of, of colloids, or even if you uh, wanna use uh, uh, as um, uh, functional uh, devices, different functional devices. So uh, what we look at uh, in this uh, mostly uh, is looking to decrease the conductivity. We look at um, uh, is normally the oxidation is characterized using XPS and other techniques, which is a little bit uh, 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 tedious process. But to look at the oxidation, we actually look at the measurements of the, uh, we look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the conductivity and we can show that basically when we make the films, uh, uh, vacuum filter films from the um, uh, Maxine uh, uh, colloids and uh, uh, measure the titanium oxide content from XPS and the conductivity uh, as the titanium oxide content increases over the time. Uh, and this is all for titanium 3C2 Maxines, the conductivity decreases which is more important actually if you look, uh, especially if you're in Texas where the humidity is relatively high and it's very, very hot. Uh, actually, even if the films are dry and you keep it in an in open air, uh, in, in, in the air at a different humidity, that actually affects the conductivity. If you have a 0% relative humidity, the conductivity really doesn't change for a long time while the, in the cases of the increase in the conductivity start dropping down significantly. Uh, yes, the different kind of the media has been also, uh, uh, and, and uh, Vadim also mentioned that in the previous talk, if you look at the conductivity in the dry air or conductivity in the ice, we need it basically cold freezing down and cooling it a, at a lower temperature actually prevents the whole process. Or if they are actually in a polymer like composite like PVA, what we also showed is basically that uh, UV light exposure to UV light affects significantly the, uh, the loss of the conductivity due to the oxidation, faster oxidation. So if you are exposed to the UV light, the uh, oxidation uh, uh, rate uh, uh, is, um, uh, the oxidation is quite fast. So, um, so to continue on the Vadim work also, so actually, uh, yes, it's, it's the water actually that's very, very uh, uh, crucial and water is uh, um, uh, one of the advantage of using uh, max phase of vaccines versus other 2D materials in terms of the practicality of uh, making devices is that we can easily actually disperse them in, in water, but uh, uh, because the water is, uh, it's, uh, uh, but they actually start degrading uh, after long times uh, in the water. So that's why we decided to look actually to understand this mechanism to look more in more details in uh, what it will happen if you actually change the pH of the water and change the, so have a more uh, OH or, or H plus uh, groups. And this actually shows that if you keep the, the, the same concentration of, of initial maxines in different pH uh, uh, solution and uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the, in, in, in the high, highly uh, uh, alkali solutions, the pH value uh, start dropping significantly, uh, suggesting that uh, OH groups are being consumed significantly by maxines 
while in the in the in the acidic environments actually that more or less stays the same uh, unchanged and then uh, um, uh, the the molecular dynamic actually modeling shows that uh, that, that uh, in the case of the OH groups kind of when we put vaccines with uh, uh, they tend to uh, completely attack vaccine nanosheets uh, uh, while uh, uh, HVO plus plus groups mostly arrange themselves around the, around the corner. So what we believe is happening in this case when we have a long OH groups that are highly a, a, attached to the to the to the maxi nano sheets is that basically they cause a uh, uh, deprotonation uh, mostly of OH terminal groups, uh, giving you water molecule and then um, uh, unbonded uh, uh, one oxygen that's basically unbonded, which is kind of which is very very reactive, and start actually the oxidation process. Uh, so we can see here actually that uh, the corresponding XPS that in the case of the of the of the um, vaccines, the number also, the, 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 the case of the acidic environment, the oxide, uh, and the quantity of titanium oxide goes up with the, with the time. I'll skip these slides for a practicality. Uh, also, the oxidation, oxidation is concentration dependent, as we know, and uh, if you assume the model that's capping on steroid shielding, affects that basically protecting vaccine from uh, uh, oxidation each other we can for semi use a semi dilute transformation model to a transition model to calculate what would be critical concentration and when we put the typical the diameter and thickness of the vaccine we got a size of about four, a concentration about 4.4 milligrams per milliliter and this electrical conductivity actually uh, 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 and results uh, confirm that it's, uh, uh, it's in good agreement with these results. So, uh, you know, there are lots of different methods has been proposed how to actually prevent the degradation, including the uh, minimizing amounts of oxygen, keeping the uh, everything at low temperature, keeping it in dark, not exposing to UV, keeping it very dark air, keeping in colleagues in how concentrated, all those measures actually can prevent the degradation of maxine, but those are not very practical, especially uh, uh, if you're going to make uh, de devices and films that may oxidize in human environment. So uh, then uh, by working on that, um, uh, Shelfe uh, got idea to use, use something that are uh, actually, to treat maxines with something that are actually high, uh, well known antioxidant like uh, ascorbic acid, or, uh, or the, it's salts, the tannic acid, and more recently uh, citric acid, and this is actually uh, was highlighted in uh, NSF uh, on that website. But uh, now, since we introduced the citric acid, uh, basically it's only not vitamin C, but also the lemon juice that can protect you from uh, um, degradation vaccines. So, in some sense, what's good for human is good for vaccines too. So uh, when we look at a, at a, a, a sodium ascorbate, for example, that shows these are the results uh, as prepared in the water or initial solution, initial colloids, actually, and after 21 days, we can see completely the, completely the degradation while in ascorbic acid, they look pretty good still uh, and uh, disperse nicely and dark black. So, uh, so um, um, also MD modeling shows that basically the sodium uh, ascorbate has a tendency of 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 uh, 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 arranging around uh, around the, the nanosheets, uh, shielding the nanosheets, while ascorbic group actually shielding the nanosheets from the degradation uh, and oxidation. Uh, so, um, yeah, XRD also confirms that when we start with the uh, with uh, uh, as prepared nano sheets after some time, or, or after six up to 21 days, we don't see typical characteristic uh, um, uh, peak for non uh, for vaccines. While a stored in sodium ascorbate shows a very uh, uh, stable structure and a formation of uh, any oxides. And this is also confirmed uh, by uh, using uh, XPS, as we can see, uh, you know, as prepared. In the water one, you can see that the fraction of titanium oxide is significantly higher after 21 days, 
while in the case of the dose protected in uh, sodium uh, uh, ascorbate is, is a much lower, a uh, little bit higher than in case of the water, but uh, controllable. So in terms, uh, even when we make a bucket paper by vacuum filtration of the uh, uh, on the sodium ascorbates are treated vaccines, uh, it basically shows that the conductivity, yes, initial conductivity of those films is, yeah, is a little bit lower than uh, films that are just uh, pre fresh film that are made. But over the time of 21 days, the, the, the degradation uh, of the, uh, in terms of the conductivity is, is much, much slower than uh, on vaccine films in the, in the, in the water uh, and uh, that were kept in the water. So the, 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 also it shows that even ascorbic acid or tannic acids can, uh, can uh, be used as an antioxidant. And in the last paper, actually, we uh, showed that the citric acid can also protect the titanium uh, 3C2 vaccines uh, from the, uh, a greater extent uh, from the oxidation than, than uh, uh, ascorbic acid. And what's even more important is that uh, it can protect titanium 2C, which is a uh, uh, more prone to faster degradation uh, uh, in the aqueous uh, 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 colloids. So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, I would just uh, summarize and I would like to thank the uh, uh, funding agencies for uh, uh, supporting the research so far at Access AM for the entire group. and. Uh, of course, I want to thank to uh, you all for uh, your attention. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for the really uh, exciting talk. Um, I remind all the audience that you can submit questions through the chat box. Uh, we have a, a few minutes for questions. So uh, the first question is, when you use vitamin C, is there any sodium intercalated in the maxine? Uh, as we saw from Dr. Naguib's talk, we know something happens once you intercalate cations. Uh, do you have any comments on that and any thoughts on the mechanism of presenting, preventing oxidation? So they, they, these are all, uh, for, first, uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is all very well dispersed uh, maxines, which are single to none, uh, 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 that we were talking about on a single to, uh, to few sheets together. So this is all, all done here work was on Actually, from the call, it's not really on the on the on the undispersed uh, uh, vaccines delaminated. Uh, no, we didn't see present of uh, any significant present of sodium left after after the washing out process and uh, and uh, vacuum filtration to films. Yeah. Uh, okay, we had another question earlier in the talk um, that is often noted that the formation of aluminum oxides during synthesis. Uh, of Maxine's presents further etching of the A element. Um, do you have any comment on, on that or, or? We didn't find any evidence of aluminum oxide. So most of the, of the over the over etching uh, is, is uh, so most of the aluminum actually should form aluminum fluoride and uh, uh, we didn't find any evidence of aluminum oxide. Right. Okay, do we have any other questions from the, the audience? Uh, is there any relationship between the intercalating agents used for delamination and oxidation of the maxine sheets? Or can uh, increased oxidation in water be attributed to the delamination agents used to separate the few layered sheets? Uh, so, um, for, to answer the second question, most likely no. To answer the first question, the Possibly yes, because uh, as we showed, it's basically that uh, basic environment uh, actually promotes the uh, oxidation. So if you use inter intercalates and basically are, uh, um, uh, that are um, alkali in nature, that may actually promote uh, 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 oxidation, faster oxidation during the process. Right. Um... We're, we're sort of running out of time. If anybody types uh, one more question into the chat in the next 10 seconds or so, we might have time for that. Um, otherwise, oh, okay, to, one last question. To what extent do we have knowledge of the oxidation resistance of other maxines? 
Uh, well, I mean, that, that question was uh, actually discussed already a couple of times and mentioned. Uh, yeah, it seems that titanium, of, of from all those processes now, and that we know titanium 3C2 are showing the best uh, uh, the degradation resistance. Uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 the one that uh, we know is probably worse than um, Labak mentioned that in the morning is a vanadium one so far. So yeah, the all others are somewhere in between, <laughs> probably. Okay, well, um, thank you again so much for the, the wonderful talk. Uh, what we're going to do now is we will take a 10-minute uh, intermission. Our next speaker, Dr. Lynette Madsen, will, will begin uh, her presentation at 11.35. That presentation would not be streamed on YouTube. So anybody watching on YouTube, come on over to the Zoom site. There's um, plenty of space uh, over here. So um, at this point, we will take a 10 minute intermission and um, resume the presentations at 11.35 Eastern time. Antennas are the technological glue of our ultra connected society. They connect our calls, send our texts and emails, and let us post pictures and videos from almost anywhere. Antennas give us the freedom to stay on the go, from highways and subways to airports and checkout lines. They are also the key for unlocking the potential of smart technology. Anything you want to communicate with, collect data from, or remotely control needs an antenna. Just imagine the things we could connect with if installing an antenna was as easy as doing a little spray painting. At Drexel University, researchers are doing just that, spraying antennas. All it takes is a few dashes of a special water-soluble titanium carbide powder called Maxine that was invented at Drexel. And a little water, just mix and voila, antenna spray. The spray-on antennas work because of the Maxine material's unique ability to transmit radio waves when applied as a very thin, even invisible coating. Maxine antennas function just like the larger metal ones in phones and mobile devices, but they take up virtually no space and can turn almost any object into a fully functional transmitter with just a few sprays. Just think about all the things you'd like to spray and communicate with. Lost socks, car keys, pets. This antenna technology could help us communicate with just about anything. Okay, maybe not anything, but some really important things like roads and bridges, baby cribs, hospital gowns, and other things that help keep us safe. This research is connecting us with the world in exciting new ways, and it's only happening at Drexel.